<laughs> All right, council's back in session. We're going to hear two bills uh, prior to uh, moving to the comp plan. The first one is item D, which is R169. Councilor Gibson. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, R169 is amending resolution R16. 100 which created a new priority objective within the public safety goal relating to the creation of a naloxone protocol and program for the Albuquerque Police Department and I'll be moving a due pass on this uh, Mr. President I think that we have three individuals who are signed up to speak okay so we uh, actually uh, on R169 we just have uh, Justin Hazen Signed up to speak? Is Justin in the house? Welcome. And there's a motion and a second for a due pass. I'll second that on R169. Good evening. Welcome. Thank you very much for inviting me to speak tonight. Um, my name is Dr. Justin Hazen. I'm a board certified emergency medicine physician um, who is also assistant professor of emergency medicine at the University of New Mexico. I um, have a vested interest in the community. I was born in Albuquerque. All my um, training was completed within Albuquerque. That included undergrad, um, medical school, residency, and a fellowship. Um, before uh, attending the university, I worked for Albuquerque Ambulance um, as an EMT uh, before, during, and after medical school. And, uh, and since that time, I also completed a law enforcement academy in 1995. Um, so um, to address the committee in regards to Narcan, Narcan is a very important drug. It doesn't work for everybody, but it does um, help reverse um, individuals who have suffered from a narcotic overdose. Keep in mind that Narcan only works if you have a beating heart. It doesn't work once the heart has stopped. At that point, CPR combined with automatic external defibrillation is the only thing that can um, bring back the person who suffered from an overdose. Uh, so Narcan is very important. If you have to look though at specifically where Narcan should be implemented. In 2006, I trained the Mexico State Police for Rio Arriba and Santa Fe counties for Narcan um, administration through what they call a, a MAD device, a mucosal device, it's a nasal device. Um, since that time, um, the, we've done uh, extensive research in Albuquerque. In 2001, I uh, became the medical director for the Albuquerque Police Department, and since 2001, tactical units have deployed with Narcan. The reason I chose to deploy uh, tactical units with it is because you limit the traditional EMS response due to law enforcement activity. Since 2001, I've, there's been no administrations of Narcan. Um, I do believe it has an approach, but it should be with uh, narcotic agents and open space, which doesn't have a traditional EMS. Albuquerque is blessed with a very robust EMS service. Fieldwide distribution of, EMS, of Narcan should not be administered, but targeted, yes. Sorry for taking your time. Thank you. Thank you. couple folks who didn't know they needed to sign up, but Mr. want to come on up and speak, those who were Mr. President, prepared. Councilor if Gibson. I may. Uh, yes, we do have um, Officer Joel Holt from the Rio Rancho Police Department, as well as uh, Captain James Lamb um, uh, from, from Santa Fe Police Department, um, and then Dominic Zerlo from the Harm Reduction Program uh, he's program manager for DOH. So would you gentlemen like to come up and just, uh, um, actually the, uh, the police officers, the captain and uh, Officer Holt. We, oh, Dominic, that's fine. That's okay. We'll start with you. Thank you. If you could just give us a very brief um, uh, summary of, thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. President. Thank you. Uh, Councilors and especially Councilor Gibson uh, for inviting me and having me here to speak. I do have a couple of slides. Um, thank you for allowing me back again since I was here back in October. I just really wanted to um, provide you with just a little bit more information regarding the lockdown and the importance of it. Um, right now, what we do have is the program here in New Mexico is really looking at trying to reduce the opioid mortality rates. And as you can see in the slides that I have here is in Bernalillo County, 
we've had um, the prescription opioid overdose rate has been 185 individuals um, per 100 uh, per 100,000, and the heroin has been 153 um, with that. Um, and what we really want to be able to do is naloxone, which is also called Narcan. And the newer device is actually a development, it's actually Narcan, and is much easier to use. And that's what the Department of Health has actually been distributing for the last several months. We switched over from the older device, which required assembly. People would fumble it when they were trying to put it together. And so this newer device has actually been a lot easier to use, and people have been able uh, to be able to utilize it even under stressful circumstances. And now, naloxone only works with regard to opioids. But here's how successful the program has been. In calendar year 25, which is the last line on here, we trained throughout the state of New Mexico 2,459 individuals in how to utilize naloxone. That same year, we had 769 individuals who reported back to us that they had utilized naloxone successfully. That translates to a 30% usage rate. This is an easy medication to use. It doesn't take a lot of complex knowledge or information to be able to utilize it. People are able to use this under these circumstances. The majority of people we're talking about that have been trained are either individuals who are injecting substances or people who are around them, their family, their friends. If people are able to do this when they are under the influence, imagine what they can do when they aren't. So who can carry and utilize naloxone? Last year, we, we had the uh, state legislature passed a couple of new bills, which were then signed by Governor Martinez, which actually now allow for anyone to carry naloxone, whether or not they have a prescription. So anybody can get naloxone. All you have to do is actually go to a pharmacist. You can ask your medical provider for a prescription. But even without a prescription, a pharmacist can actually go ahead and dispense this to you. Um, there are copays with it. Copays are actually very minimal on it. The older assembly device, the copay on most insurance plans is $5 for two devices. And with the newer device, the copay ranges anywhere from about $10 to about $35, depending on the individual's insurance uh, copays. Anybody can use naloxone as long as they are making sure that they're using it in good faith. And the good part about naloxone is if someone uses it and someone's not experiencing an opioid overdose, all it's going to do is give them a wet nose. It's not going to hurt them. And so what I'd really like to conclude with is when we go out and we train all of these almost 2,500 people in 2015, it's a 15 to 20 minute training. It's very basic, it's very simple, it's very easy. Uh, we provide a little bit more information, especially in areas and communities where they haven't experienced naloxone before and don't know about it. And just last Thursday we did, uh, based on the other bill that you had all passed a while back in October, we did the first training with City of Albuquerque employees and it actually went very well. And we got some positive comments from individuals afterwards who are actually excited that they'll have this tool available to them. And so I really want to thank you again for inviting me here again today, and I appreciate the expanded access of naloxone here in Albuquerque. Thank you. Um, Mr. President, we still have these. I, I think it's really important to hear these two uh, representatives from uh, other police agencies who have implemented, uh, if you wouldn't mind. Thank you. Gentlemen, you can come up together if you'd like. Uh, President Benton and members of the council, I'm Captain Lamb with the Santa Fe Police Department. I'm the, actually the architect of the law enforcement uh, naloxone program in Santa Fe, for the Santa Fe Police Department, of course. Um, we started our program back, I started the research on it back in June, uh, April of last year. April of last year, I sat down with the fire department, EMS, and the Santa Fe Prevention Alliance, and I wanted to determine how often did police officers arrive at a scene of a possible overdose or an ambulance assist than the ambulance did? And with all the research that we conducted, we found out the police officers actually arrived about 20% of the time ahead of EMS. And even if EMS arrived there, they waited for 
uh, police officers to arrive and make sure the scene was safe before we went in. So it made sense to us to actually start this program. So the next thing I did is I said, well, out of all these ambulance assists, how many of them could we have saved a life? I was looking for one, just one, and a whole year's worth of uh, reports, I found three where I thought that we could have saved a life. So what we did then is we reached out, we found some training in the state, we found a, a supplier for it, which is the Santa Fe Prevention Alliance through some grant funding. And uh, at the same time, I sent out a survey to my officers. Would you carry this stuff? Would you utilize it? How effective is it? Do you think it would be? And they didn't like it. They, they don't like change. Officers don't like it. They weren't gonna do it. So I said, all right, we're gonna do it anyway. I'm a captain, that's the way it works. So uh, we conducted the training. We trained uh, uh, 13 officers. They were our core trainers and they went out and we trained 147 officers, which is all of our patrol and part of our investigations team. So everybody on the Santa Fe Police Department carries naloxone. It looks, I don't know if that thing's still on, but it looks just like this. Carry two of them in your CPR mask, it's no big deal. And we trained them. Uh, after they first started unit, using them, we actually did our training in November, about mid-November of last year. And by uh, a week later, we already had two saves. We are up to now 16 uses of naloxone, and out of those 16, we saved 15 lives. Unfortunately, that, that one, we revived them at the scene, but when they got to the, uh, the hospital, they perished. But very effective. So, sir, I just have a question for you. Um, uh, how did you determine which police cars to put those in? Uh, what, what, um, what officers carry naloxone? Uh, Mr. President and Councilor Gibson, we actually put them in all. Okay, all right. We have uh, AEDs as well, but we only put those in supervisors' vehicles. Okay. Um, but uh, naloxone is in every vehicle, even once at the police department, substations, and anywhere else we could stick them there. Okay, but how long did it take you to implement your, your program once you decided to put it in? Well, I started the research in April of last year and I finished up with the training and in November we went hot, we went live, and uh, we've done 16 to date. Great, thank you so much for coming down. Yes. Mr. President, counselors, thank you for having me. I'm Lieutenant Joel Holt with Rio Rancho Police Department. I'm the program manager of our naloxone program. It's not as far along as Santa Fe's. We're really just getting started with it. It was like Santa Fe, not taken as something we really wanted to do. It had a lot of opposition from the officers and even from some of the command staff. After doing some research with it and looking into it, all the things that you're being told are, are true and it's ultimately the risk is relatively low, the cost is relatively low, but the potential to save a life is high and as a basic tenant of Rio Rancho, we, if there's something that we can do to improve the lives of our citizens and save a life, we're gonna jump at it. So that's why we did it. That's why we don't regret doing it. And that's why it's in the, in the progress of getting to where all of our officers have it. So that's where we are with that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Councilor Sanchez. Thank you, Mr. President. I want to thank uh, Councilor Gibson and the Albuquerque Police Department because I am looking at the dates that were, were originally formulated and these dates have been moved forward. So the implementation of this program will be sooner than later. So thank you, Councilor Gibson. Other discussion? Councilor Gibson to close. Uh, I just urge your support. Thank you, Councilor, and also commend you for your perseverance on this. There's a motion and a second for a due pass on number 169. All those in favor say yes. yes. Opposed? And that passes. We'll move now to item H. <clears throat> this is uh, Councilors Lewis, Sanchez, and myself, R142. Uh, Councilor Lewis? Thank you, Mr. President. R142 is calling for a study of the need for, for feasibility of and methodology of implementation of consolidating public safety services within the incorporated in unincorporated areas of Bernalillo County, does, does designating funding for the study. I move a due pass. Second. There's a motion and a second for a due pass on R142. And we do have a couple people signed up to speak. If they'll come forward and sit up front, Tad Nemiski and, and Ed Harness. Okay, Mr. Harness. 
Yes, good evening, President Benton, uh, fellow city councilors. Um, uh, I'm here just to make sure that when you do the survey that oversight is uh, considered as a component of, uh, of the survey and how you would see oversight working with an integrated department because right. currently we only have jurisdiction over the Albuquerque Police Department. But if we're going to be integrating sheriffs uh, and we are to do our duty under the ordinance, then we would have to work out that oversight component as well. And thanks for pointing that out, sir, and uh, we appreciate your service. You know, we had a, a study session with regard to <coughs> concerns about the effectiveness, or, or, or really not the effectiveness so much as, as the uh, interactions between the uh, Civilian Oversight Board and, and the APD, and we certainly take that very seriously. And <coughs> I, for one, will say that I certainly would expect that, that this would be subject to civilian oversight. Could you say anything about what you know about the county civilian oversight, or is there a system there? Uh, President Benton, I'm not aware that there is any system uh, for county oversight. Uh, when we get a complaint for the uh, sheriff's department, we refer them to their internal affairs division. Thanks, and, and uh, we've also had some questions just since we announced the, the intention to have a study of people asking about the, uh, the CASA agreement and so forth. Obviously, these are things that would have to be looked at and, uh, uh, and considered by the, the consultant when they're brought forward. But um, Councilor Harrison and then uh, Councilor Lewis. Yeah, thank you, Mr. President. This is just really a question for staff. I mean, this is something that could be done by an instruction to the person that we hire. We don't have to amend Councilor Lewis's uh, bill to make, make sure that that oversight is included in, as part of the study. Right, that can be uh, directed to the consultant, but I would point you to section one uh, paragraph three that talks about one component of the study being an analysis of how such a consolidation could occur in a manner that is complementary to or improves the city's compliance with the provisions of the federal court approved settlement agreement and of course oversight is a critical component of that council agreement. Councilor Lewis. Thank you, Mr. President. Thanks po for pointing that out, Mr. Zaman. And, I'll, and if we need to clarify that any further, we'll do that also with the was another study that there's specifically oversight and that you all are, uh, are uh, um, you know, ask questions and that you go over this. And I just wanted to, I guess, as, a, as, as some introduction to this, and certainly we've, we've been able to see this, or we've looked at the proposal of this study for, I think it's been a couple months now since it's been introduced. And I, and I would point out also that, because I think some of the questions um, have to do with some of the, you know, what would the outcomes be and if the intention of this study is to ultimately get to a complete unification of public safety between the county and the, and, 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 uh, and the city. And <clears throat> that, that may certainly, you know, be the case, that there are recommendations that, that there's, uh, you know, what comes out of the study is that there's the how-to and looking at what other agencies have done. But I also believe that there are some, there are some strategies that can be very tailored, you know, to you know, Albuquerque, to Bernalillo County, to our region. Um, and some of those strategies might just include uh, the functionality of um, some of what we already do, which is some, some, some joining together, some, some memorandums of understanding uh, where we share some resources and we could take that further. Uh, possibly to include dispatch or emergency communications as well as records. I mean, there's so many things that make a whole lot of sense um, before we ever get to a full uh, unification that, that might require a change in the state constitution and things like that. So I just want to point out that this study allows for, um, uh, you know, a, a variety of possible variations and outcomes, including, you know, the, the bill talks about cross-deputizing or pooling resources. Um, so I think there's some very smart, you know, data that we can get, you know, out of this study. And again, not just the, not just the why, uh, but the how. I think we can really learn some good things on the how and, and uh, give us some good s insight on how to possibly proceed. Thank you, Mr. President. Councilor Jones. Thank you, Mr. President. And Mr. Her I'm sorry, no, no question for you. It's just a question of the sponsors probably. Um, I appreciate the fact that uh, we're taking into consideration our settlement agreement. I think that's essential. I'm not confident that the, uh, the sworn officers from the county, from Bernalillo County, would be willing to participate in our settlement agreement, but this would certainly put them in that position. Next question is, have we, cons have we discussed this in any way with Bernalillo County, their manager, their counselor, their commissioners? I think if, if they're not willing, I think we might be putting our cart where our horse should be. Councilor Sanchez. 
Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, we have had discussions uh, with the Bernalillo County Commission through the Albuquerque Bernalillo County Government Commission. Uh, we've not presented this resolution, and I think that brings a very valid point. I know that the commissioners last night uh, on the media spoke that they were not aware of what was going on. I think they should be well aware of what's going on because we did have a meeting where the, the sheriff was at one of the meetings talking about the consolidation of city and county public services and along with the two fire chiefs. So we've been in discussions with the county, not in depth in looking at this resolution. I think they probably should be uh, involved in this process and even hopefully paying for some of the cost of this uh, study I think would be beneficial. Councilor Jones. Thank you, Mr. President, and thank you, Councilor Sanchez. I do 100% agree that they should be aware of this, but apparently they're not from what I've been reading. And I think it goes far beyond discussing it with the sheriff. I don't believe it's the sheriff's decision. So I think, I think I would really like to see some more homework done on this and say who are we, who's gonna be participating in this? Who's gonna, who are we gonna talk to it? Whose decision is this going to be? Obviously it is not our decision alone. I, I like the idea of it, I like the idea of the finding out, but I think we should make sure that all parties who we are trying to find out about and or for uh, should be a party to this. And I will just respond to that um, and then let uh, Councillor Lewis do so. Um, I would just say that, that I'm not, uh, of course, anyone who's a constituent of mine is also a constituent of the county. And, and I am regularly asked by constituents, uh, you know, how is it that we, if at all, do we coordinate between the city and the county on public safety? And of course we do, there, there are agreements, there, there are some protocols in place, but something as simple as the, uh, the dispatch center for fire, just, uh, this goes back, I know Councilor Sanchez has even more history than this, but this is my history, which is that, that I thought we were on the road towards consolidating the dispatch center for, for just for fire only. And uh, suddenly, I, you know, th there were indications from the county that, that, or at least some of the commissioners, that they would support that. And then suddenly, it, you know, for, it was never really explained, but, but uh, the support for that totally diminished. To me, it's about getting data, getting examples, getting best practices, and just finding out. And so then we could have a public discussion about it. I don't feel like we need to ask permission from the County Commission to, to conduct a study. Um, I certainly would, would expect that the study will involve them and, and, and have discussions with them, but it's also about uh, uh, looking at best practices, as I say, and data from other cities. But um, I'll let Councilor Lewis, but it looks like Mr. Zavon wanted to interject. Well, Mr. President, I just wanted to point out um, section two of the resolution also says that <clears throat> should the council pass this, it would be my responsibility to, to direct the contractor to work with both city and county staff and include representatives from the CAO's office, the Bernalillo County Manager's office, the Sheriff's office, uh, police union, and fire union. So um, should the council pass this, it would be my responsibility to make sure it was a collaborative effort. And I, I know for a fact the fire union has, has, has been supportive of this. And of course those unions sep, uh, represent both entities, but Councilor Lewis. Yeah, and, thank, and Mr. President, I was actually just gonna read that right there that Mr. <laughs> Zaman just read. Thank you for pointing that out. I mean, we were, I think we were very intentional, you know, within the bill to, uh, to ensure that, uh, that everyone uh, was involved in this study and everybody had input. Somebody's gotta take the lead. I mean, at some point, you know, you have to uh, take the lead and say, hey, here's the scope of a study. Let's see what we can, You'll find out we want our, our, our decisions to be driven by data um, and we want to get everybody's you know research and, and background and opinion in that that certainly includes the county manager uh, but I'd ho I would hope that the county commission and others would have some good discussions about this also and, uh, and and that's one of the reasons why we wanted to put this in the hands of our director uh, to lead the way in that and to be able to help you know bring about a good study every time I've talked about this with uh, uh, with, with, with anybody, whether it be our fire uh, command or our unions, um, you know, there's an openness to say, yeah, I think that would be some, some good information to get. Um, and so uh, it'd be, it's a worthy goal, you know, to take a good look at it. And certainly Councilor Sanchez and Councilor Benton have been a part of uh, uh, conversations. I've been on that, you know, the Bernalillo County and, and City, you know, committee, commission. It's been about six or seven years now since I was on that. But I remember, you know, talking about the, 
uh, the fire dispatch consolidation, and that was on the agenda for a good year of discussing that. And so I also was, uh, um, you know, surprised that, that that discussion didn't really continue. And so, so I think the study helps to put a little bit more teeth to, you know, continuing that discussion, getting a little bit more serious about moving that down the road. Councilor Jones. Thank you, Mr. President. I'm, I'm not saying that I'm opposed to this. I just think that we need to do a little more homework before we start on it. And it is true. All of my constituents are also constituents of the county, but not all the county constituents are constituents of mine. So I think that we would be far better off to get a, a very open agreement on doing this study and the county participating in the study before we simply go forth and say we're going to do this and we're going to have the county participate in the study because that's not our place to tell them to do that. I just think it would be nice if we simply had a discussion with them rather than passing a, a resolution saying we're going to do it. Um, I mean, we, we live in the same building, so it, it shouldn't be that hard to do. For now. For now. <laughs> Maybe for quite some time. Councillor Pena. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. President. Well, first of all, I just want to say that what I was chair of the ABCGC last year, and, and it was there was a huge presentation on, on the consolidation. And at the time, and just for the record now, I just want, um, want it to reflect that on the surface, I, I don't support consol the consolidation of, of um, public safety, um, but uh, I do support you know a study because at the end of the day, I think one of the results of this study could um, show an indicator of improved services for both um, the city and county and how, how we connect. Uh, I, I think I mentioned this at the ABCGC that, you know, um, it's gone out to vote and we've tried to consolidate in other areas and, and people have really um, come out against um, um, this type of consolidation. But again, for the record, I, I would support this study. Thank you, Mr. President. Councilor uh, Gibson. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, I uh, applaud the sponsors on this. I think this is a, a great start, uh, just starting the conversation, um, getting information, uh, researching the, the data that's available. Um, you know, it's much better to make informed decisions. Maybe the decision will be that it's not a wise thing to do but I would certainly rather have that discussion with, uh, with uh, data in front of me uh, rather than waiting for a catastrophe, which we've had in the past mm -hmm. um, related to uh, jurisdictions for fire. Um, so I think this is, this is great and I'll be voting for it. Thank you. I would just add that, that that discussion six years ago, if, if, if uh, Councilor Lewis is right, whenever that occurred, that, that at the time going in, it was not only uh, another county commissioner, uh, a county commissioner and myself that were interested in doing it, but both, the, uh, both of the fire chiefs were solidly behind it. Uh, and that was just on that dispatch. But again, um, information is good, and, and information is good for public debate. And uh, yeah, the, it may not go anywhere, but I appreciate your support, Councilor Pena, to, to at least find out more about what these look like in some other communities. Okay. Any other discussion? Um, if not, uh, Councilor Lewis, if you'd like to close or? Thank you, Mr. President. Yeah, I think we have, uh, when, when you think about it, we have four different public service agencies that are all great. I mean, they're all really, uh, with phenomenal public servants, but they're, they're serving essentially one group of people. And, uh, you know, it's just good practice, I think, to see how we can do that even better. Uh, what kind of efficiencies and what kind of duplications we can, we can remove and what kind of efficiencies we can gain and just how we can just better serve people when they're in their, their most time of need. And so I'm looking forward to you know, what, the, what the study is going to result in. I urge your support. There's a motion and a second for a due pass. All those in favor say, oh, I'm sorry, uh, Councillor Pena. Sorry, before you close, I was just gonna ask for clarification. So, um, Councillor Lewis just said that um, they're the same people and we represent, what, what's, the, what's the breakdown? Because anyway, no one probably has that, but what's the breakdown in the county? The unincorporated areas, do you know? Do you happen to have so I think one of the statistics. Population? 
I, I believe uh, the city has 83% of the total population in the county. The unincorporated, unincorporated areas, I believe, comprise between 17 and 20%. So mm -hmm. roughly four parts out of five in the city. Okay, thank you. And Ms. President, I think there was another uh, statistic. I think it goes at something like 90, I wanna say 96% of the county uh, population lives in, you know, urban or suburban and more dense, you know, uh, parts of of the region. I guess that's that's another one of the statistics that we looked at that, you know, we share essentially uh, the same regional boundaries as well as uh, population. Gotcha, Sanchez. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. I know this is going to be a challenge. It has been for many years, especially with the communications of the Albuquerque Police Department and Fernalillo County Sheriff's Department along with a fire, both city and county. But I think this is a step in the right direction where we can get necessary data to look at the potential benefits of a united and unified county and city public safety department, both with the police and fire. When someone calls 911 and it's a, a priority one call, they do not care if it's a county truck or a city truck, they just want that response to be immediate and hopefully we can address response times because right now I know that the city of Albuquerque and the police department is in some challenging times and I, we can't dismiss the fact that we do need more police officers with the Albuquerque yeah. Police Department. But I think this will guide us and give us information that we need and would ask for your support. There's much to the second and a due pass for, uh, uh, the, wrong, the wrong bill here, I'm sorry, uh, for, the, uh, for the bill. All those in favor, say yes. 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 Opposed, and that passes uh, with a one negative vote, uh, yeah. Councilor Jones. All right, and uh, so we'll move on to um, the next three agenda items, which are 027, R108, and R109. They'll be discussed together since they all relate to the comprehensive plan. As you'll recall, these items were continued from our March 6th council meeting, and therefore we'll begin this evening by picking up where we left off at our previous discussion of the items. And um, on uh, R108, um, I'll move a do pass. I think we, are, didn't we actually already move all the, these do pass, do we, have, we don't have to move them again. Right. Um, Mr. Resume. President, uh, we did that at last meeting, yeah. but you're welcome to renew well, let, let's, let's just resume discussion then, we don't have to have, to have motions. Um, I would like to, uh, we're gonna have a number of amendments uh, in your iPads and on the dais for reference. And if there are no objections from counselors, there are a number of the amendments, many of which I uh, am sponsoring, that are minor changes to the amendment packet. And those are the items labeled A, B, C, D, H, J, L, N, O, P, and Q. And uh, that's a lot of the alphabet there. Um, uh, and these, these uh, were presented in, 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 by staff as, as considered to be fairly minor amendments. And, uh, but so if, if there are any one of these that a counselor would like to not have considered together, otherwise I think we can consider all of these together and hear from uh, Ms. Schultz with her uh, synopsis of, of, of each of these uh, minor, uh, lesser amendments. I think many of them are might only change a word or two, but in my opinion, they're very important words that, that uh, they do change. But, t but in terms of uh, length and, and complexity, they're fairly minor. So, Shauna, if you would please uh, just describe each of these, uh, these uh, lesser amendments. Thank you, Mr. President, I'd love to. Um, to clarify, we're talking about the uppercase letters that you mentioned, not the lowercase ones that are found in the amendment packets. So beginning with uppercase A, this amendment would add the downtown skyline and its backdrops from all directions as a cultural landscape and establish policies protecting views from it from major public rights of ways. Amendment B would add policies for site design utilizing the strategy of crime prevention through environmental design, also known as SEPTED. Amendment uppercase C would add a policy calling on the planet, planet, planning department to work with stakeholders in the downtown urban center to assess whether the existing boundary of that center, which is defined by the boundary in the current downtown 2025 sector plan is still appropriate. Amendment uppercase D would add additional policies strengthening protections for neighborhoods in areas of consistency. Moving on to amendment uppercase H, 
this would update language on the jobs housing imbalance between the east and west sides to reflect a more nuanced analysis of future projections. Uppercase J would add language in the heritage conservation chapters section on historic neighborhoods and plazas outlining the importance of El Camino Real to the city's historic development. Uppercase L would address various additions and updates based on comments, more minor language <laughs> tweaks or additions to actions and policies in the document. Uppercase N would add new or updated language about planning for public transit, complete streets, lighting, and traffic calming. Uppercase O would add flooding risk to a, a list of items that the planning department would analyze in the community planning assessment process. Uppercase P would remove language recommending the vacation of alleys from a policy encouraging more productive uses of vacant land. And lastly, uppercase Q would add language calling for more equitable distribution of objectionable land uses and make some grammatical changes. Thank you. And, um, Councilors, uh, just a little clarification on, on uh, Amendment L. <clears throat> there, uh, that was that was one that was in the packet last time, and there is a little bit of additional language in that that uh, that I added, or were added at my request. This was uh, this was an amendment that I uh, uh, sponsored, and those are highlighted in yellow, and <clears throat> some of the uh, some of the uh, language in this particular chapter five land use, uh, page 551, there was language that said uh, encourage, uh, the, that the city would encourage uh, two items. One was uh, uh, pre-application meetings uh, and the other was meetings with neighborhoods. So this adds the word encourage and facilitate uh, such meetings. Um, and then the other one on heritage conservation, um, this has to do with the, uh, this on chapter 11, Heritage Conservation, and this has to, go, to do with the Petroglyph National Monument. Um, and we added a section that re really just copied over from the protections at, of the Bosque. So uh, these have to do with, with uh, more careful planning along the edges of either the Bosque or the Petroglyph Lash National Monument. And so this adds that to, uh, to the National Monument section. Uh, so that's what that, uh, the only change with that item L. Are there any discussions on these amendments? Councillor Jones. And just to be clear, Shanna, uh, we went through A, B, C, D. We skipped E, F, G. We went to H, skipped I, went to J, and then down to L, N, O, P, Q. Mr. President, Councillor Jones, yes, that's correct. Thank you. So this is the package of, of uh, what we're calling minor amendments. And again, I would just say that, that uh, although they're, they're called minor, um, it's really because of the, the, we're not adding lengthy language or making uh, great changes to, to uh, language, but in my opinion, um, these amendments uh, do strengthen uh, the protections that, that a lot of what we've been discussing and hearing from the community about. And uh, so I will go ahead and move this, uh, this group as an amendment, second. as a motion and a second. Any further discussion? All those in favor say yes. 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 Opposed? That passes. So we'll move on now to um, the other amendments and we'll start with um, We'll start with uh, item E, the, the, uh, the amendment labeled E, and this is, uh, uh, has to do with the west side truck restrictions, and Councillor Lewis is the sponsor. And myself. Uh, I'm sorry, and Councillor Sanchez Thank together you. are the sponsors of item E, and this would be amendment number two. Councillors? Mr. President, so this is um, referring to Exhibit A, R16108, hereby admitted as follows. Chapter 6, Transportation, page 6 through 52, add a new action 6.6.3.3 6, 6 as follows. Work with constituent jurisdictions and the mid-region council of governments to assess whether there is adequate truck access to serve employment 
and commercial activities in the Volcano Heights Urban Center. And he proposed changes to truck restrictions should be considered with input from local stakeholders to ensure that such access does not impact adjacent neighborhoods or roadway design uh, regulations. Uh, this amendment would carry for a po policy from the Volcano Heights Sector Development Plan that was not clearly incorporated into the updated draft. It was recommended by a participant in the process. I got a, I got a question about this, Mr. President. So, Ms. Schultz, uh, Councilor. How does this, is this, is this the same type of language that's in the Volcano Heights Sector Development Plan? Uh, Mr. President, you. Councilor Lewis, it's very similar. The language in the Volcano Heights um, Sector Development Plan says something about assessing the need to remove or modify the truck restrictions. Um, it's been made a little more open-ended here to just assess truck restrictions. That doesn't necessarily state to remove them, to add them, but to do a more general assessment of the need. Um, and it calls for uh, more stakeholder involvement when that assessment does happen. So um, what, how, would, how would you describe the current truck restrictions in the specific area that we're talking about, if any? Uh, Mr. President, Councillor Lewis, there are some truck restrictions on Unser Boulevard as far as we know, and those would be a part of the assessment as well as any other roads that currently service um, the urban center in Volcano Heights, the proposed urban center in Volcano Heights. And do you know Heights. specifically those truck restrictions on Unser Boulevard, um, are, are there, we know for a fact that there are those restrictions that are written in law on uh, Unser Boulevard? Mr. President, Councillor Lewis, I am not positive. I would. Ask uh, someone from the project team, perhaps Ms. Renz Whitmore, if she has further information on this. Okay. President Benton, Councillor, uh, yes, there are restrictions in place today. It's R55, 105, something like that, um, that established a prohibition on truck restrictions. There are also truck restrictions on Paseo del Norte to the east. And these are, are the, is it the state? Because Paseo is a state road. Unser was prior a state road and now it's a city road. So is it now that it's a city road, those restrictions still apply? So my understanding, counselors, is that the truck restrictions are negotiated as part of the memoranda of understanding with the New Mexico Department of Transportation as we talk about who's going to maintain and whose roads they are mm -hmm. and that those restrictions are written into those memos. So this action would result in looking at those memoranda with the, the Department of Transportation as well as the Mid-Region Council of Governments to see on a regional level how you provide truck access that would actually support the urban center without negatively affecting neighborhoods. And you'd say that this is this statement here would be pretty consistent with the current Volcano High Sector Development Plan and the, the, the development of, uh, at the, pr the projected development at Paseo and, and Unser. President Benton, Councilor, I believe that this language is less directive than the Volcano Heights language, which, which says to look at the removal, as Shanna mentioned, that this language just says do an assessment of how you would best serve the urban center with trucks, uh, as opposed to look at removing the truck restrictions. Well, I think that, that at the time, you know, we, were, we created a major, you know, that Volcano Heights Sector Development Plan created a major, um, what, what do you call it? Just, it was a, a major activity center Correct. right there. I mean, a, a very large major activity center. So the concern was ensuring that there was the proper kind of access to the kind of jobs and you know that would be there. This this one seems like it's um, it's. Uh, I mean, so that that statement was because of the fact that the change was this major activity center, whereas this statement to me feels a little bit like. Um, Almost like kind of taking a different consideration, you know, that uh, just because of the language of it. I know this is my own amendment here. Um, it seems like it's pulling it back a little bit. Maybe I'm wrong. Good. Let's hear from Councillor Sanchez. And I have the same concern and questions. It sounds like you're pulling back on the restrictions when the restrictions were put in place for a reason. And the community came together and that's what they had requested and wanted. So are we going to be limited on the restrictions? Does this open up the possibility of less, res less restrictions and more truck traffic? President Benton, counselors, I don't believe that this particular language presupposes the outcome of the assessment. I believe the language is written in the 
updated comp plan provides more guidance that's directive than this amendment. So if you would like to go back to really advising that we look at the truck restrictions themselves, I would advise you to go back to the updated language as written. Okay. And, and um, Michaela, um, I think it's important to note that, that um, and I don't, maybe I should ask you, did the, did the original language refer to the Council of Governments? Because, I mean, that is a good resource for something like this, uh, or not. Uh, President Benton, counselors, yes. Actually, the Volcano Heights language uh, says to work exclusively with the Mid-Region Council of Governments. When we re revise that language to bring it into the updated comprehensive plan, uh, one of the members of the public pointed out that it's actually a, a private agreement done through the Memorandum of Understanding. So the language was shifted to say work with the other uh, jurisdictions that, that have power over that road and to coordinate with the Mid-Region Council of Governments. Yeah, it does specifically say uh, work with stakeholders uh, to ensure that such access does not impact adjacent neighborhoods or roadway design regulation. Councillor Lewis. Yeah, Mr. President, yeah, I, I think it probably expresses the correct statement, I think, at this point. So um, I'm good with it. I was probably overanalyzing it a little bit, but I think it's probably the, probably the best statement that's, that's probably relevant to this, you know, to the plan. And again, I'm just very concerned based on the statements that I've heard regarding the restrictions. I mean, this does allow more flexibility. And without these restrictions in place, it can be looked at, analyzed, and assessed, is what we've been told by staff. So, I mean, that could potentially change what happens and what occurs and what restrictions are in place based on what we've been told. Is that correct? Uh, Mr. President, Councillor Sanchez, um, yes, but it's not any more restrictive than what the Volcano Heights Sector Development Plan has today, than what the policy is on the books today. So that flexibility with the Volcano Cliff Sector Plan is still allowing some review of truck access? Or uh, is Ms. it full restriction? Uh, Mr. President, Councillor Sanchez, it, the policy in the Volcano Heights Sector Development Plan guides the city to assess whether it should be removed, and all it says is should it be removed, whereas this uh, phrasing says should it just be assessed for changes that could be made more restrictive, less restrictive, it's not as specific as the policy on the books today. Thank you. Councilor Lewis. So, Mr. President, this is floor amendment number two, and I move a due pass. There's a motion and a second for a due pass in floor amendment number two. All those in favor say yes. 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 Opposed? And that passes. Next, we have uh, the exhibit labeled F, as in Frank. This would be floor amendment number two. And this is the Coors Premium Transit Corridor. Councilor Sanchez. Um, Mr. President, would that be floor amendment number three? This will be number three, excuse okay. me, yeah. Thank you. Uh, basically, I'm not sure if you want me to read all this into the record, or do you want the explanation? I, I think the explanation is probably adequate, and then we can. Everybody can look at the actual language, but this is labeled, again, F. And it states, uh, this amendment would update the comprehensive plan centers and corridors map to revert the proposed designation of Coors Boulevard from premium transit to the existing major transit designation adopted in 2001. It uh, would amend text references in the comprehensive plan to Coors as a premium transit corridor. So basically, it would revert back to the language in 2001, which would make it a major transit designation and not a premium transit designation. All right, thank you for that explanation. Uh, is there, uh, Councilor Lewis? Yeah, Ms. President, so if, staff, if y'all would the best you can to give the best description or uh, um, difference between major and, and premier. Sure, Mr. President, Councillor Lewis. Um, this really comes into play for the integrated development ordinance. When you have a premium transit corridor, you are allotted density bonuses along these corridors um, when they are within transit stops. This would pull back some of those densities where we were told it wouldn't be quite so appropriate on Coors Boulevard. Councillor Jones. Thank you, Mr. President. Is Coors 
Board of Boulevard not one of the, I'm not gonna call it a premium or a major. Isn't it one of the streets that is most used and designated for north-south traffic on the west side of town? Mr. President, Councillor Jones, yes it is. So, if I may, so whether we call it a major or a premium, it is a major premium. <laughs> Mr. President, Councillor Jones, there are more nuances when you get into the definitions, but yes. I mean, th it, it is reflected on our, uh, on our, uh, uh, our overall transportation plan map uh, as being a, one of the higher opportunities, I guess, if you will, for transit. And, uh, and, and that's been a conclusion of the Council of Governments, but I think uh, the, the sponsor is responding to concerns that, that uh, um, this would open up the door to uh, too much density in that corridor vis-a-vis -vis, uh, views and such, but uh, Councilor Lewis. And Mr. President, but this would also, I mean, major as opposed to, um, to, to premium would, would reduce or limit the ability for the roadway to handle more transit, correct? Uh, Mr. President, Councillor Lewis, I would again ask some of the project team to come up and clarify that. So which, which, which uh, designation would allow for just uh, more opportunities for transit um, or in which would limit it? I mean, would, would, the, would the major limit the opportunities we would have to be able to move more people with transit and, and create less transit opportunities along the roadway? President Benton, Councillor uh, Lewis, both are priority transit corridors. So the comprehensive plan distinguishes among different corridors for the priority that should be assessed on that corridor. Whether it's a major transit or premium transit, we are saying with this designation that transit should be a priority. And the studies that have been done for years about cores have generally shown that there is no way to increase throughput for private vehicles. And the only way to get more people through the corridor is by putting more people in fewer vehicles as you do with transit. So there's no, from my perspective, there's no um, detrimental impact on being able to focus on transit by making it a major transit corridor. The difference really is does it, uh, does it jump the queue to say um, that we should really be focused on premium transit on cores or, or can we just continue with the rapid ride service or other kinds of things that are less impactful of the infrastructure in the roadway. The real difference when you get to premium transit is a dedicated lane. As we're seeing on Central, that, ha that comes with pros and, and cons. So in this sense, you're probably gonna be asked or counselors in the future are probably gonna be asked, it, doesn't it make sense to provide a dedicated lane on cores at some point, um, making it a major transit just puts off that decision a little longer. So Premier would be a vote in favor of a Coors ART. <laughs> <laughs> Those are your words, Councillor. <laughs> it, really, it, essentially, it's a, a Premier, I, I guess, gives, gives more of a emphasis on um, prioritizing dedicated lanes, dedicated transit lanes in the future along the corridor. Correct. Is that really the okay? Yeah. If, if if you look at the if you look at the map where these were mapped uh, as presently, it corresponds directly with the Council of Governments uh, high capacity transit system as opposed to um, even though rapid ride is somewhat high capacity, this this would be a higher capacity system, and it would be because it, it would run more often at least in dedicated lane. Uh, let's see, Councilor Davis, and then Councilor Sanchez. Thank you, Mr. President. I think, I think we cleared it up there. I was just trying to get to the point of, I think the major transit essentially says, if I read the definition correctly, it says, um, sorry, let me get back to it. They're generally auto-oriented with transit interspersed as opposed to a dedicated transit focus. So can you, if you recall, or, or Ms. Schultz, either one, I recall for the Mr. Cog transit uh, traffic counts reports that um, Coors is about it, auto capacity as set, right? And it's by 2020 and 2040, it's gonna be somewhere north of 120% of capacity with expected growth, is that right? That is correct. Okay, thanks. Councilor Sanchez. Talking with the community and the neighbors and living on Albuquerque's west side and representing these different neighborhoods, uh, it is at capacity today. And we do need to look at the future and hopefully we can 
you know, provide for more transit uh, centers where people can ride the bus and get off their vehicles mm -hmm. because we face many, many challenges. But at the same time, right now, today, in the situation that we are in, uh, we, I believe we are even beyond capacity. Uh, you get on cores and, and drive that route uh, early in the morning, 7 o'clock to 8 o'clock or 9 o'clock. It's a major uh, bottleneck throughout that corridor. So, you know, we do need to find ways to make it more convenient to get people out of their, out of their vehicles. And hopefully in the future, uh, if we ever see phase two of the ART, you know, some of that money will go to, to Coors for additional uh, transportation dollars to get people out of their vehicles and maybe eventually in the future have a dedicated lane for just transit vehicles. But right now, all we have is Paseo del Volcan, we have uh, Unser, and we have Coors. And with the continued growth on Albuquerque's west side, it's becoming more and more of a challenge each and every day. And I would just point out, this is a designation for the purpose of our land use policy. This would not prevent us in the future from doing a different kind of system on that road or require that it be done on that road. So I just want to point that out. This, this, the comp plan recognizes the importance of planning transportation along with land use, and, and that's what this is about. So uh, it, it doesn't tie our hands in any way or a future council's hands. If, uh, if they wanted to, uh, to proceed with a transit project, a special transit project on the corridor. Councilor Gibson. Uh, just a thought, when uh, Councilor Sanchez was talking, it sounded like you were making a case for keeping it as a premium uh, transit corridor. So were you trying to make a case for keep, no, keeping I, that? No, that's why I have the bill that I have introduced in this uh, amendment, uh -huh. is I do want a major transit designation right. and not a premium transit designation, although I do believe in the future that right. we have that opportunity to expand. Okay. But it, we it, need and you more, said all that. You we said need all more that. roadways. But the, the okay, so the, the, um, the, the logic that, were you, you, that you were using was sounded like, and I believe if you look at it, it does support um, it as a, a premium. Uh, but whatever, I'm, I'm going to support you on this, but it was just odd All hearing right. that perspective. Thank you. Thank you. Any further closing? Urge your support. All right, there's a motion and a second for floor amendment number three to R16108. All those in favor say yes. 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 Opposed? Yes. That, uh, and there's uh, one vote against Councillor uh, Gibson, or Councillor Jones, excuse me. <clears throat> that takes us now to... The item labeled G, this would be floor amendment number four. And this is Councilor Pena. Thank you, Mr. President. Just make sure I find where I'm at. So um, without reading the entire amendment, um, can I just read the explanation? because the entire amendment's like three or four pages. So I can read the explanation, then I can have the staff um, add to it. The amendment would provide policy guidance for more robust and culturally significant outreach and engagement between the city, county, governments, and the public. The proposed language is in response to public comments about the insufficient cultural, culturally insen um, insensitive public engagement. Thank you. There's a motion, and I'll second that from uh, Councillor Pena on floor amendment number four. And um, Councillors, uh, the the, uh, the new language is in uh, green on, on your packet, um, but it does, I, 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 as I understand it, this has been uh, also <coughs> discussed in detail and vetted by the city's Office of Diversity and Human Rights, and they support this amendment as well, and I think it's an important, uh, important, strong additional language in the comp plan. But sh is there anything specific you'd like to point out, Ms. Schultz? Mr. President, I don't think so. As you mentioned, um, we did meet with several offices in the city who added to this language and supported what we had to say to make sure that city staff gets um, the right training to engage with the public successfully and equitably. Any other discussion, councilors? If not, Councilor Pena, to close. I would urge your support. Thank you, Mr. President. So there's a motion and a second for 
floor amendment number four, labeled G in your packet. All those in favor say yes. Yes. Opposed? And that passes unanimously. Um, to my roadmap here. Um, next is labeled I. And this would be floor amendment number five. And this is Councillors Harris and Pena. Thank you, Mr. President. And actually, I think this is really driven uh, by the intellectual power of Councillor Pena. So, and so I think I'm going to let her take the lead right. on this. Councillor Pena. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. <laughs> Let's see if I uh, talk myself out of this one. So anyway, so this one, um, again, without reading the uh, entire um, amendment, um, this amendment um, addresses public concern about the importance of sector plans, the rich history included in many of those documents, and the community effort that went into drafting them. So I, before I go to Michelle's, I, I can just add that, you know, I just think it's important. One of, one of the things that I had written down last time is that, you know, we were talking and, and people were talking about areas of the city and, and different areas and for, for the community and, and um, what many people may not gather or, or they do is that just that, you know, these sector plans were developed with a lot of work, you know, and, and it talks about the historical perspective, the community, culture, all, all the, um, everything about the community uh, in terms of the areas that everybody was describing. But what I wanted to add was that these areas aren't just areas in the city of Albuquerque. These are areas that were old land grants. There were villages in our community. You look at um, a Martinez Town, Pajarito, Los Padillas. These were all towns that predate the city of Albuquerque. And if, if we want to, as a city, pre preserve our rich history and culture, and why many people even come to the state of New Mexico or the city of Albuquerque, because of the allure, because of the people, because of the food, because of the culture, then we have to pay attention to these historic neighborhoods. So, Michelle. Thank you. And, and um, the, uh, I think it, it is important to note that, that um, you know, a lot of the discussion about the, the effort that went into the existing sector plans does, many of them contain some pretty important historical uh, uh, analysis and, and also uh, really social analysis of, of the individual neighborhoods. And I think this is acknowledging that and certainly including them uh, within the, the comp plan document and, uh, and would be used as reference as well when we're doing the IDO. I think it's important to note that, that, that as we adopt the IDO, these will be in the comp plan for, for immediate reference uh, as we go through it. Ms. Schultz. Yeah, Mr. President, I'd like to clarify just a couple of things. So what this would do is add a new amendment to the back of the book that would add all the sector plans as they exist today for reference. Um, as you know, if the comp plan were to be adopted today, it would not make the sector plans ineffective. That would be done at, at a later time through the IDO process. Um, as we brought the policies into the comprehensive plan and the regulations into the zoning code, we did hear from the public that the, the third part of those documents, the narrative, um, wasn't being brought over. So this, this is how we are proposing to do that. All right. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Davis. Uh, briefly, Mr. President, thank you. Ms. Schultz, uh, if I could just follow up. I, I, if I recall correctly, and I've seen some for the uh, sector plans in District 6, the planning staff here has actually taken each of the sector plans and mapped them against sections of the comp plan. For example, where paragraph 6 in a particular sector plan um, where the goals of that are either re-articulated in the comp plan or the section of the IDO to be discussed where that area should be targeted by people who are working on that. Did I explain that right? So we've done an analysis with each of those sector plans to be sure that the key components are, are translated over, uh, just as, say, for instance, Councillor Lewis's truck question about Volcano Vista, for instance, uh, identified this problem. But, but we have those analyses of where people can either find the old references or where they can focus in the IDO to protect the pieces that are important. Mr. President, um, Councillor Davis, particularly in the IDO, there are specific mapped areas for regulations that were very specific to one area that shouldn't necessarily be applicable to the entire city. Um, in your district in particular, carports, the, car, the um, prohibition on carports is one of them, and that does have a specific mapped area that relates back to the sector plan. Um, 
but those are mapped individually in the IDO, so the sector plan would not need to carry on for that particular map to live on. Thank you, Mr. President. Michelle, just to clarify, but those are available online for folks to reference as they go through and want to begin to look at us with the IDO, they can map their old piece of a sector plan that applied to their their issue or concern. They can see where they can in, where that can be translated over to the IDO. Is that Mr. correct? Mr. President, Councilor Davis, yes, that's Thank available you. on the project website. Thank you. Councilor Jones. Thank you, Mr. President. And Ms. Schultz, Ms. Schultz. Um, as I'm translating this in my mind, what we're saying is that these sector development plans will be for reference only in an appendix. They are not a rule set in place. They are simply when the IDO is in place, they can look at this appendix if they so choose to say maybe this has uh, language saying why it was done this way. Mr. President, Councilor Jones, yes, that's correct. They are for reference only um, at the point when they are rescinded, if they are rescinded when the IDO comes through, um, that's when they become reference only. They are, of course, still in place until that time. Thank you. Councilor Davis. Thank you, Mr. President. And one quick follow up, Ms. Schultz. Thank you, Councilor Jones, for reminding me. Ms. Schultz, if I can just clarify from my recollection from our conversations, for sector plans, for instance, and I know it's a big, a big topic of conversation, so I want to be sure that we've covered the base here. Um, there are some places in sector plans where common um, themes arise, and in those cases, those best practices that applied across the board are being incorporated citywide, either into the comp plan or IDO as citywide rules. Is that right? Mr. President, Councillor Davis, yes, for sector plans that had policies that said, um, had similar intentions, they were brought over into the comp plan and consolidated into one policy instead of saying the same policy in 14 different books. And to follow that, Mr. President, Ms. Schultz, the, say for instance, there's a particularly unique standard in a particular sector plan that was developed with the neighborhood over time to, in a particular neighborhood. Um, those can still be mapped to a smaller area, not citywide, but say to a neighborhood or a particular development area through the IDO process. Is that correct? Mr. President, Councilor Davis, yes. And Ms. Schultz, my final question, if there's a standard that's, say, outdated that is one on one of those sector plans that was printed out on purple mimeograph from 19 some odd before I was born and hasn't been used since, uh, we can either remove that or it's been mapped to an updated IDO standard that makes more sense now since, like, we have cars and things. Mr. President, Councilor Davis, I'd ask Michaela to speak um, to the idea that we discretionarily removed okay. policies. I, 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 I don't, thank you for that, Clifford. I don't mean we removed them. I'm just saying for things that have been outdated and don't seem to apply to the modern way we do business, we've still mapped those to the more updated version um, of how we're doing planning so that we're not missing those components. Is that correct, Ms. Well? President Ben, Councillor Davis, uh, just a clarifying question. Are you asking about policy or regulation? Uh, old regulations that are in the sector plans that are perhaps outdated. Um, but even those we've evaluated, considered, and either found where they've been updated in this new document uh, or made the recommendation and, and justified how they don't apply. And I don't think I ever saw, I think there's a process for doing that, but I don't think any were ever actually listed out that said this doesn't matter anymore. President Benton, Councilor Davis, uh, those regulations are being looked at through the integ uh, Integrated Development Ordinance, but no regulation appears in the Comprehensive Plan because it's a policy document. So. That analysis and those discussions about making sure that each of the regulations from the sector plans has absolutely been part of the discussion in the past two years and will be a huge part of the discussion as the integrated development ordinance goes through the planning commission first and then to you through the land use planning and zoning committee and then to the full council. Thank you so much. And uh, Councilor Pena. Just to add for clarification, so, um, so in the comp plan, um, Ms. Schultz, can you um, help me out in terms of um, the policy? Because I know as we're talking and we're talking about the IDO, um, that's where we'll, we'll um, determine the regulation. But through this um, amendment, it would keep the sector plans in place. And then once the IDO is done, it could either keep, it, keep them or get rid of them. Uh, Mr. President, Councillor Pena, this amendment does not um, address what would happen to the sector plans at the time of the adoption of the IDO. That would have to be determined at that time. Um, it says regardless of what happens. Okay. Mr. President, I'm sorry. So I should have pro provided more clarity. So, so this one keeps them there as an appendix. But uh, I guess my, my um, question again was that um, 
as we move to the IDO, they're still existent. And at the time we get to the IDO, that's when we'll either keep them or remove them, correct? Mr. President, Councilor Pena, yes, that's been the intention all along. Okay, Yes. and then my next um, question is, um, in the comp plan, is there any reference to removing the sector plans? Mr. President, Councilor Pena, I would ask the project team if there are specific policies that would guide the planning department to consider removing them. Uh, President Benton, Councilor Pena, there is not a policy in the comprehensive plan directing us to remove the sector development plans. There is narrative discussion of the intent of the ABC to Z project to go from multiple books to a policy book, the comprehensive plan, and one zoning code, the integrated development ordinance, but no specific policies that say um, how to get there by rescinding sector plans. So is this one of the, um, Mr. President, sorry, um, is this one of the issues that is actually um, one of the concerns of the community members that you do reference that in there? So it really does um, make um, sector plans very vulnerable. President Benton, Councilor Pena, uh, the resolution that you passed in uh, 2014 directed us to update the comprehensive plan, pull in the policy protections from the sector development plans, and then move on to coordinate the zoning into an integrated development ordinance. So at your direction, that is what we have described in the comprehensive plan as doing and what we are intending to do with the integrated development ordinance. Your vote tonight has no effect on the sector development plans as they stand today, but certainly as part of the discussion of the integrated development ordinance, that will be the big question. So Mr. President, um, so the, the vote you're referring to talked about updating the comp plan, correct? This is, this is correct? President Benton, Councilor Pena, yes. Okay. So this is kind of a complete revision of the comp plan. So, I mean, you know, when you're telling us about what our direction was um, years ago, um, I, I just know that, you know, I, we really need to work on um, preserving um, the integrity of the, the communities. And so to kind of stay a, state a blanket statement like that, <laughs> is kind of a little tough to, to swallow. So, thank you. All right, any other discussion on, uh, on floor amendment number five? If not, there is a motion and a second. All those in favor say yes. Yes. Opposed? That passes. And next in our packet is item K and uh, I'm sponsoring this amendment. And uh, this is a, a miscellaneous uh, um, language that, that uh, we're, we would be adding uh, to address uh, changes uh, recommended by public comment and in response to public comment, um, you, can, you can kind of scan through it, but um, we're adding, you know, in, in one, just as an example, chapter four, established neighborhoods are protected, preserved, and enhanced. Um, um, there's a, there's a uh, language about community identity in central Albuquerque, uh, which mentions the, uh, the original old town so settlement and agricultural areas, and then the new town development. And the original uh, residential subdivisions, many of which have been designated historic, uh, again, add some more language, enhance, protect, and preserve neighborhoods. Um, partner with the private sector, and we added the words on this particular one, uh, neighborhood organizations to redevelop vacant land. So, you know, typically when you're talking about redeveloping vacant land, uh, some developer has their eye on it and, and they want to develop it. This is making it clear that we would be working not only with with people proposing such things, but the neighborhood associations and organizations as well. Um, we added uh, some language about uh, landscape open space and plazas and courtyards, um, promoting uh, cost-effective housing redevelopment and construction. This is in existing neighborhoods that meet community needs. Um, housing redevelopment being a very important issue in some of our older neighborhoods. 
And uh, I often have spoken about how the city needs to up its game with regard to our housing redevelopment efforts. And uh, it's a continuing challenge, but this at least uh, memorializes it in policy. Uh, and then heritage con conservation, um, we changed uh, words uh, on this. It, I think there was something like, uh, uh, what was it before, Shanna? It was a different word. Uh, this this uh, uh, appropriate edge treatments and transitions and buffers in development. Uh, I think the other one was just a, a lighter kind of language, and this uh, says ensure rather than uh, some suggestive type language. So, no, no need, but I think, I think it was something along the lines of support or something, and this says ensure rather Mr. than Mr. President, I, th I think you're correct. Okay, so that's uh, floor amendment number six. Any discussion? I urge your support, floor amendment number six. Uh, I don't think I moved it, I'll move it. And, and there's a second from Councilor Davis. All those in favor say yes. Yes, yes. opposed, that passes. And then next uh, would be floor amendment number seven. This is uh, labeled M as in Mike in your packet. And this is my amendment. And this is the language I mentioned earlier during uh, in response to one of the public uh, uh, comments. And this adds language to guide the order in which we conduct CPA assessments. As you, as you know, the CPA process that's outlined here, again, it doesn't, it doesn't dictate what's going to be in those assessments and, it, and, and what's going to emerge from those process, processes, but it does point out that there should be, uh, it provides some prioritization with regard to those, uh, to those processes. And uh, it, it specifically points out um, protections for neighborhoods within each CPA and factors outlined in Appendix D to help identify at-risk and vulnerable communities in need of more immediate planning assistance. So that would, that would include some of these older sector plans and some of the places that have no sector plans. We have, we have some strong neighborhoods and well-organized neighborhoods that don't have sector plans. And, and with all the discussion about uh, saving our sector plans, there, there hasn't been much discussion about the need for planning processes in these places that still have the old straight uh, zoning from, from uh, essentially written uh, and bought off a shelf back in the 1950s. So this does say uh, specifically at risk and vulnerable communities in need and have more immediate planning assistance and, and uh, makes that clear. And uh, it directs the planning department to uh, submit to the council an analysis and recommended order in which CPA assessments should be done uh, to best address these historic patterns of disinvestment and environmental just injustice that disproportionately affect at-risk and vulnerable communities. And uh, uh, so it, it's stronger language with regard to that. Um, and then uh, following that first step, the uh, planning department would recommend to the council uh, a five year, the five year schedule. So the, our first five year schedule would be, would be recommended to us for, for approval um, as, as to how we would move forward on the, on the planning assessments. Um, and and it, it also mentions the fact that if anybody doesn't know already, the council uh, as of beginning of next month will be taking on the Office of Neighborhood Coordination with, with the exception, I think some components, but, uh, but, but the everyday functions of that, uh, we're trying to beef it up again and we're trying to put it under the council where we're, the buck stops with us with regard to the Office of Neighborhood Coordination and, and uh, um, so it talks about that a little bit as well. And um, you know, did I miss anything? Uh, Mr. Sorry. President, you covered it quite well. I would just um, like to emphasize that council would have the final vote on that order. It wouldn't ultimately right. be up to the planning department. Right, they would be making a recommendation to right. us for, for discussion. That'd be a public, public discussion on that. So that's uh, floor amendment number, <coughs> did I get that right, seven? Seven. Uh, and did I move that? I did, okay. So motion and a second on that. All those in favor, say yes. 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 Opposed, and that passes. Next is, uh, 
is labeled S in the document. This is, uh, this would be number eight, and this is Councilor Pena. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, I move for amendment number eight. Um, this actually, this amendment, and this kind of um, piggybacks on, on the discussion we were having uh, a minute ago, is that this amendment would give the community more time to work with planning staff to ensure the information from their sector development plans is being carried over to into the comp plan and IDO. I guess I can add to that um, just to say that, it, uh, again, that it piggybacks on, on the other amendment in terms of really providing um, community input and ensuring that this gap that we talked about um, just a minute ago, that the community has some assurance that um, those communities are, will be um, um, protected, if not, um, um, at least their their opinions and views would be um, put into the IDO once it's formed. Uh, Councilor Harris, yes, can we hear from staff um, on this particular amendment and see if, because I would be a little concerned if if this would actually make it more difficult to get an IDO passed or something like that. Thank you, President Benton. Councilors, uh, this amendment would actually say that you cannot adopt the Integrated Development Ordinance until we've completed a five-year cycle of the community planning area assessments. Uh, from This would also go against the direction in R1446 uh, that you directed the planning department to undertake this uh, project. Um, in terms of an update, we still believe that today's comprehensive plan is based on the Centers and Corridors vision. This update continues that vision. Uh, it adds policy protections to provide stronger guidance about where it is appropriate to grow and where it is not, i.e. areas of consistency, and replaces the development areas that were mapped in the 1970s and have not been updated uh, substant substantively since then. It also adds policy protections for neighborhoods, open space, and acequias. We mentioned that environmental justice and community health do not appear in today's comprehensive plan. This would add those policy protections and extend them citywide today. And we also talked about the sector development plans that have policies have all been incorporated. The policy protections from those sector plans have been incorporated into this comprehensive plan update to now extend to those areas that are not currently covered by sector plans. This provides policy protections for those communities that do not have them today. And from our perspective, that is a good reason to adopt this document uh, tonight, to extend those policy protections, and then go on to do the community planning area assessments that ask how well do the policies and regulations work and what adjustments are needed. If it were not true that we carried over the policy protections from those comp plan, I would say it's a great idea to do the community planning area assessment. But the fact that this is an update that continues on from the vision that is adopted in today's comprehensive plan and adds policy protections where they do not exist today to me is a compelling reason why this document should be in effect as soon as possible. So uh, did you have any other Just questions? to follow up. Um, so what you did is you explained why the amendment probably isn't a good idea, but then you spend a lot of time talking about why the existing or the, the bill before us is a good idea, and there's a little bit of a blend, so I want to make sure that we're clear about that, that most of what you said doesn't deal with the amendment, it deals with the, the, the bill before us. Thank Does that you, make Pres sense? President Ben, Councillor Harris, uh, let me clarify. The amendment would say not to make the comprehensive plan effective, and not to allow the Integrated Development Ordinance to be adopted until a full cycle of CPA assessments, the Community Planning Area assessments, were done. I'm saying we shouldn't wait to put policy protections in place that this plan represents for five years as we do a, a Community Planning Area assessment to ask whether the adopted policies today make sense. So to clarify, <laughs> we, we heard we heard a request for anywhere from several months to a two-year deferral. This would effectively, it wouldn't be a complete deferral, but it would be a five-year postponement of, of putting the comp plan or the IDO into effect. That is my understanding, Councilor. Thank you. Any other discussion? Councilor Pena. Thank you, Mr. President. Ms. Schultz. 
Where did this five years come from? Um, Mr. President, Councillor Pena, I'd like to clarify two points. Um, as written, I don't think the amendment says that the comp plan would not be effective. Mm -hmm. It just indicates that the integrated development ordinance could not be adopted until the five-year cycle was completed. The five years comes from the description of the CPA process, which is to hit all 12 areas in the first four years, um, three per year, and then take the fifth year to do to an update to the comp plan and the IDO. Um, that five-year cycle is built into the plan already. So, so when you do a community um, community assessment, that's what's required. Sorry, Mr. President. Mr. President, Councillor Pena, re required by the comp plan. Yeah, because we're talking about having to do this full cycle of a community assessment. Is that what it right. takes? Right. It would direct the planning department to spend three months in each of the twelve areas. That timeline is outlined in the document, um, which would equate to four years. And then in the fifth year, also outlined in the document, it, it says what the planning department will do in that fifth year, which is update, so, propose updates to the document. So the intent of the, uh, Mr. President, um, the intent of the resolution was three months in each of the planning areas, but not three months in different cycles. If I could just read directly from it one full round of the CPA process, that would be five years. And Ms. this does refer to the conference and plan, maybe that was in an, not intentional, uh, that to ensure their protections are being car carried forward into the comprehensive plan, comprehensive plan and IDO. So that's what I was reading. So Mr. President, so, so the amendment I would support obviously wouldn't be five years. I would support something much, much less, whether it be you know six months, three months to assess each of the areas. So n not not five years. So I don't know if we can make an adjustment to the amendment. Um, you you have certainly have the ab ability to do that, either on the fly right now, or you could we could uh, table this and hear it later in the discussion after we go through some of the others. Um, can we do something um, just real quickly to I, add to the amendment? I don't know, how. Uh, Mr. President, Councillor Pena, if you wanted to shorten the timeline, I, I think we should hear from planning staff on if they can accomplish what the assessments would require them to accomplish in that time frame. Okay. Um, Ms. Lubar, and then uh, while you're coming up, Ms. Lubar, let, let's just hear if, if Councillor Harris has a related question. Sure, it's more of a debate point, actually. I think uh, right. Council Pena, in a way, is making the argument that we should uh, accept that some of these things can be tweaked later. And this might be a, a good option to work with the planning staff to come up with an amendment to the um, comprehensive plan after we pass it to kind of work on this, because we're not in the IDEO process yet, so we could, we could work on this. But uh, I'm just uncomfortable doing something like this on the fly, going from five years to six months. Uh, I don't know. Uh, Ms. Lubar? President Benton, counselors, I would be concerned. I, I understand what Councillor Pena is seeking. I don't think that, honestly, the planning department can do a complete CPA in less than five years. To cover 12 different areas of town, to have any sort of meaningful interaction and meetings with those areas is going to take several months each. So for us to get through 12 of them, we would need the four years, and then we would need time to take that information and actually figure out what amendments we would recommend or propose to the council for consideration. So I'm just concerned that um, I, I do not support this amendment um, in that it delays both the comp plan and the IDO but I also don't see how we could do a complete cycle of assessments in less than five years. Thank you, Ms. Luar. Councilor Pena. So, um, Mr. I, I don't think you moved the amendment. Yeah, I did. Oh, you did? Okay. Yeah, when we, we first started. Was it second in the motion? Okay. Yeah. All right. Um, so how long does the community assessment take? Mr. President, you said Councilor three months to do one. Pena, yes, mm -hmm. three months to do one. So, 
if council uh, passed this amendment to get it accomplished within six months and then provided an additional um, uh, resources to actually uh, be able to pay for you know, outside contractors to help do these assessment, could we get it accomplished in six months? Mr. President and Councillor Pena, I will defer to Mr. Ingrid. Uh, President Benton, Councillor uh, Pena, we did look um, a little while ago through the Environmental Planning Commission process as this question came up at what it would take to do them all within a year. And we thought if we could hire um, private consulting firms that could each do uh, three community planning area assessments in a year, we could get them all done within the period of a year, basically hiring four different consultant teams to take on three of the uh, areas. And we estimated that that would be uh, about $400,000 um, worth of, of planning work to accomplish it all within a year. Uh, Councilor Jones. Mr. President, I would like to ask that we call the question. Second. Uh, there's a motion and a second to call the question, which would mean we, there would, uh, uh, we would not have any further debate. Uh, if, if we do that, we would move directly to a vote, correct? Uh, Mr. President, councilors, to call the question, you're going to need three quarters of the councilors present voting in favor of the motion to call the question. If that passes, then you immediately go to the motion on the uh, amendment. So three quarters, that would be six. Okay. There's a motion and a second to call the question. All those in favor say yes and raise your hand. Yes. Opposed? No. And that passes. So we're back on the, uh, the amendment. Um, this is uh, floor amendment number eight. All those in favor say yes. Yes. Opposed? No. 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 And that fails on a six to two vote. Um, the next item in the packet is let's see is there um, I think from here out are we uh, this is up to counselors whether they would like to sponsor any of these in the packet is that correct that they don't presently have a sponsor uh, Mr. President, there is one more um, capital letter amendment that does have a sponsor, if you'd like to go to that one before going to the unsponsored amendments. Um, and that's going to be capital letter R. It's on the very first page of your matrix towards the top. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. Yeah. And this was up at the top, so I got out of order. Uh, or I didn't notice it. But, Councillor Pena, this is labeled R in your packet. R is in Robin. And I believe Thank it's you, Mr. President. I'm just looking for it. I'm just getting lost in this packet. I think it's, I think it's stapled up in the front. Oh, it's in the front. Uh, this one's labeled A. Okay. Thank you, Mr. President. I found it. <laughs> So um, this is floor amendment, um, what would it be, nine? Are we on nine? Yes, nine? this would be okay. floor amendment number nine, labeled R. Okay, and this one's another one that's highly contentious. Um, actually, um, this is just the effective date of the comp plan. You know, for this, I actually have it in here that it actually um, changes the effective date of the comp plan to only go in effect once Bernalillo County adopts a comp plan. And, and this, you know, it, 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 to me it seems like a no-brainer, but, um, you know, there's obviously a lot of people that are, that are not, not supportive of it um, out in the community in terms, of, uh, in terms of the effectiveness. But, you know, we are calling it the Albuquerque Bernalillo Comprehensive um, um, Plan, and yet we really haven't gotten feedback from Bernalillo County, although I know we have different zonings and we will both implement different zonings um, uh, really to have the buy-in from, from the county I think is important and um, for that reason I'm not um, asking for a deferral right now, but you know this amendment is, is 
to not ask for a deferral, to actually put an amendment in here just to kind of put those protections in place. I actually ask that it be one of the uh, agenda items for our next ABC GC meeting. Okay. I'm going to go ahead and move the amendment. Uh, I move uh, floor amendment nine. Is there a second? Uh, seeing no second, that motion dies for lack of a second. All right. Mr. Uh, President. Yes, Councillor Payne. I do support the Sanchez. fact that this does go before the Albuquerque Bernalillo County Government Commission. Mm -hmm. I think it's an important issue that needs to be discussed by Absolutely. the county because they've not been engaged or involved uh, in this process. And, and I will just say I have had discussions with county commissioners about the whole effort, uh, trying to make sure they're on board. I've repeatedly asked staff, are they, co you know, while, while this was being developed, are they, were they working with the county because there was kind of a, a rumor out there that the county was somehow not involved and that, that turned out not to be true, that the county planning staff has been involved, if anybody wants to ask about that. But I agree, uh, this is something that, that we might wanna bring up and, and discuss it. I don't know, is it on the agenda for the next uh, meeting? So at that meeting, I think we could get a sense of when, when the county, what they would expect their schedule might be on this and perhaps what, what those particular commissioners are feeling about it. But the fact is, um, we are voting upon the city po city's policy, and if you look through the document, it's very clearly labeled what city and what's county policy and what's considered uh, acceptable to both, and uh, uh, very clearly labeled that way in the document. And uh, um, you know, the, the, this is one of these things we were just talking about the county and trying to which which uh, where does the horse come uh, in relation to the cart and so forth. Uh, with, with public safety studies, but, but uh, this is a much bigger issue, and the county certainly will uh, debate and, and hopefully adopt their part of it. I would expect they would, I would hope so, um, because this always has been a unified plan. But uh, this vote, in my opinion, is about uh, city policy. So, but, but I agree 100%, uh, Councilor Sanchez, with your statement. Um, yes, Councilor Harris. Uh, just a clarification, did Councilor Sanchez second? The motion that was that was just that a was discussion. Just said. Yeah. Okay. All right. So um, now we have a group of amendments, counselors, uh, labeled um, um, starting with T, labeled T is in Tom, um, and um, uh, and then followed by lowercase A through. Um, L, I have that right, uh, A through L, and um, these these are, um, I guess, perhaps we could, uh, this would be up to a counselor here to, to move one of these, but uh, uh, at present there, there haven't been any uh, interest expressed, but um, what, why is T a capital T? I thought the rest of these were, were community uh, proposals. Mr. President, um, yes, this one was drafted at the direction of um, council staff, but it does not have a sponsor at this time. Okay, so, uh, all right, so could you explain it? This is at label T as in Tom. Yes, capital letter T, Mr. President. Um, it would take an existing policy in the comp plan today and bring it over into this plan word for word. Um, it's that first small paragraph in the amendment that says respect existing neighborhood values, natural environment, soil conditions, and carrying capacities, scenic resources, and resources of other social, social, cultural, recreational concern when regulating the location intensity and design of new development. Um, this policy was brought over into the new comp plan. It was just split up into four different areas because as the policy stands right now, it addresses environmental concerns, social concerns, cultural concerns, and we made it, uh, the project team made it more specific to each of those topics um, in the various chapters throughout the book. Uh, what this policy also does is it makes um, that respect only apply to new development as it's worded in the policy right now. Um, where it's worded in the new comp plan, it doesn't just apply that respect to new development, but anything that were to happen on a site. Okay, 
So um, just going in order, if you're looking at these, chapter four is the community identity chapter, so those are two changes to that um, about respecting neighborhood values and um, heritage conservation goal. And then um, the next one is chapter 11, which is heritage conservation, uh, referred to above or, or cross-referenced above. And then uh, the last one is chapter five, which is a land use, which these are mostly cross-references, really, it appears to be. Um, Mr. President, that's correct, except for the first one. The first one that does change the language completely. And, and, and the staff feels like this is a positive change to Mr. President, not, not necessarily. Um, <laughs> this would make the policy less broad than what it is in the comp plan as proposed because of that last line that makes it only apply to new development. The policies in the book don't say that that respect only applies to new development. I'll just, I'll read the policy in the book really Thank quickly, you. it's short. Respect existing neighborhood values and social, cultural, recreational resources, period. So that wouldn't only apply to new development, it would apply to redevelopment or anything um, that would uh, cause an applicant to refer to the comp plan uh, for policy guidance. Is there any counselor who wants to sponsor this amendment? Uh, counselor, counselor Davis. Very briefly, uh, Ms. Schultz, just to help me clarify, under the book version, for instance, uh, if I wanted to redevelop a property next door to me, the book, the new comp plan would apply. Is that right? However, this amendment may say that the comp plan may not apply because it's not a new development. That Mr. President, Councillor Davis, that's exactly correct. Thank you. Mr. President, I don't think that's the direction we're trying to go here. I think this rule should apply to everybody equally. I think that's not, I think that's a designation that's important. All right. Thank you. I don't see a sponsor, so Councillor Pena. Mr. President, thank you. Um, I just want to add a couple of things in terms of the, the final amendments that we have here. You know, we had a meeting and we asked for a deferral. You know, many community members came to us and said that that they had not um, really um, had their voices heard and, and really wanted an opportunity to provide some input um, to the process and to the comp plan. So um, what I asked of anybody who talked to me is that, yes, I, I understand your concerns, but if you could provide any, any um, in the form of an amendment, um, bring those forward so that we can review them and discuss them as a council to see if there's something that we would adopt. Um, I actually, as a courtesy, I mean, I'm willing to put my name on each and every one of these um, um, amendments and have the discussion and see where it may be beneficial for us to add to, to the comprehensive plan. I think. Um, so uh, are you uh, proposing this to sponsor this and move yes. this floor amendment? Yes. All right, there's a motion for, uh, this would be floor amendment number nine, or 10, ten. excuse me, 10. And Councilor Pena, sponsor, is there is there a second? Seeing none, we'll move on. And would you like to do the same for these others? Um, and is there any, I, just, I guess I want to ask staff and also uh, legal, as far as, as, as far as what's in these, um, uh, we probably ask staff to summarize them briefly as we go through, uh, if, if Councilor Pena intends to move each of these. But, uh, but it, it, I think, um, uh, I don't know, it, it, I think it's up to the will of the council. If there's not a second for any of these, I don't think there's any point in, in having an extensive discussion about them. Councilor Jones? Thank you, Mr. President. We've had these in front of us for two weeks. Yeah. I see no reason to read the intent or to go over each and every one of them just to say, that just to not have a second, so I would like to see, I would hope that the sponsor uh, would move all of them in one package. I suppose, uh, I mean, here's, I'll just put this out there. Um, is there a counselor that wants to second any of these lesser amendments? Councilor Sanchez? Uh, thank you, Mr. President. I would like to look at, uh, I guess it's lowercase j, the environmental justice. I think the abatists have brought up some very good points, and I'm not sure if that could also be addressed uh, with the IDO because I think there are some serious concerns that we have for the San Jose area. I know there's a federal uh, lawsuit going on at this time. 
But I've, I feel it's important that we look at some of the impacts and the environmental injustice impacts that it's created uh, for that community. And I'm not sure if staff wants to respond to that. Can we deal with this uh, through the IDO? Because I think we cannot ignore this fact that there is environmental injustices uh, for that area. And, and Councillor, I also looked at this one carefully because I thought it had a lot of important points in it. And, and almost everyone, I, or I, I went through it in detail. And as I went through, I either found existing uh, protective policy language in the comp plan as, it, as, it, as we now have it amended, especially with the amendments that have been passed, or they were specific items that as we were discussed earlier when, when we, were, we were asking about the questions from Mr. and Mrs. Abeta um, uh, of, of, and the staff response was that we could strengthen regulation through the IDO that would, if not totally solve these issues, that would certainly m make a step forward in terms of protection of these communities that have undesirable and, and noxious type land uses adjacent to them uh, as a result of in many cases from times before that we even had a zoning code. So I think, um, but, but I'll ask staff to respond to that. And then it, what I'm hearing is that you may be interested in seconding the motion if, if depending upon the answer, is that right? Okay. Mr. President, Councillor Sanchez, I would agree with much of what you said about how um, the language that they've requested in those amendments exists in the comp plan or um, secondary that some of what they're asking for is past the purview of what the city is able to do. And we've asked environmental health to come tonight to speak to some of these. We sat down and reviewed Amendment J with them um, and their, their response was very similar, but if you would like to hear their, their perspective as well. Um, Ms. Leonard, come on up and, and um, I would like to hear that. And then perhaps just after you to have uh, uh, Michaela come back and just kind of clarify what she had said earlier. Mr. President, I'm, I'm sorry, before the presentation, for, for staff's purposes, can we clarify, is there no second for items A through I in the packet? I did not see here any second for items A through I, so there's, I don't think there's a point okay. in having detailed discussion about them. Yeah. Mr. Uh, President, Leonard. can I also clarify, there are two little A's related to R108. So is there, is there no second for either of them? There's one at the beginning of your packet uh, and then one later on. That. There's, there's one to the amendment to the exhibit itself, the yeah. comp plan, and then one to the resolution itself. Let, let's go ahead and hear, hear let's, con, let's continue on item J, which there is some interest in, and we'll see about the lower, multiple lowercase I's, A's. <laughs> Ms. Leonard. President Benton and members of council, in reviewing the amendment that's um, lowercase letter J, Environmental Health Department um, became concerned that it um, presented a potential conflict with the state statute in regard to air quality regulations and we wanted to make the council aware of that. If you need more detail, um, Ms. Parker from um, Legal is here and she's the air quality attorney. Right, and this goes back to what we were saying before. Uh, or Ms. Renz Whitmore said that, that uh, um, you know, we can't, we can't make stronger nor weaker policy. This is a, there is a preemption issue here. Um, but I, I so, so thanks for that clarification. I don't know if anybody wants more detail on that, but I think that's, that's something I was expressing as you've probably heard me <laughs> express that's before, right. concerns about our, what is our air quality board really doing if we're just following state uh, regulations or basically being a functionary of the state. But uh, did, was there another question from another counselor? Just one clarifying. Uh, uh, counselor Davis. Sorry, I know I'm asking a lot of questions. I just think I want to cover the piece here. Ms. Leonard, thanks. We don't want to forget to talk to you on this, so thank you. Uh, we mentioned it, we sort of glossed over it earlier, but for example, as you understand the comp plan, and maybe our planners can help us as well, uh, and I think it's actually in the IDO probably, but 
Uh, there are stronger protections now that deal with cumulative impact, for instance, with new considerations for the numbers of air quality permit holders in a particular area and the density of those that don't currently exist. And that's a result of community input around environmental justice questions. Is that your understanding? I'm going to defer to, um, to Ms. Parker or uh, Michaela on that one. Great. Michaela, you want to come up as well because we're probably going to just have British a discussion media. with the three of you. Mr. President, Councillor Davis, my name is Carol Parker, and as Ms. Leonard um, pointed out, there are some very, very strong limitations in the state statute about how air quality can be regulated. Mm -hmm. And with regard to cumulative impacts, as a lawyer, I would say that the legislature's primary restriction was against limiting situations where you have large sources, sources that emit hazardous air pollutants, and situations where air quality is already bad. There are express limitations for that, mm -hmm. which is precisely the scenario where you might expect cumulative impacts. So each of those would have to be looked at very carefully uh, because I, it seems less likely that the council would want a cumulative impacts ordinance that applied only to very tiny sources um, that did, had fairly benign emissions when air quality was known to be good. <laughs> um, that's the state statute that we have, but that was the legislature's direction, and that is, for your um, information, what you have now in the city ordinance as well as the county ordinance that the Air Board regulates through. Thank you. And uh, McKellie, yeah. you want to just kind of re-summarize what you told us before with regard to what the opportunities, uh, you know, I think we heard about a lot about the limitations, but the opportunities within a land use document. Mm -hmm. uh. President Ben, counselors, uh, let me just start first by saying that the goal 13.5 community health and the updated plan has policies that don't cur currently exist in our comprehensive plan about uh, protecting public health, safety, and welfare by discouraging incompatible land uses in close proximity, such as housing and industrial activity, mitigate potential impacts, la la la, um, uh, encourage environmental friend friendly technologies and processes for industrial activity uh, under healthful development, um, encourage public investments and private development that enhance community health. Uh, under public infrastructure systems, uh, coordinate with providers to ensure that systems and services do not compromise the health, safety, and welfare of the community. And particularly under that one is a sub-policy that says, recognize, analyze, and minimize the potential adverse disproportionate impact on at-risk communities inciting new public infrastructure and services. Um, we developed these, this language uh, because it was such a big part of the discussion during our public engagement process that community health was an important thing and that many communities, uh, San Jose among them, were uh, disproportionately burdening the uh, results of industrial activity. And so these policies would help establish a basis by which not only we um, come up with regulations in the integrated development ordinance such as separation distances for mm -hmm. industrial activities that, that require an air quality permit, but also as we do those community planning area assessments, uh, one of the things that we'd be looking at is health statistics in each of these areas to see uh, um, cancer rates, obesity rates, those kinds of things, and every five years be able to track progress toward more healthful communities. Councilor Davis. Michaela, thank you for that. And I, I know that we've hit bits and pieces of those earlier. Mr. President, thank you. I think what I see here is uh, tonight we've adopted 17 different amendments. Some of them we did in bulk, but it, all total 17 different uh, amendments to the IDO um, thanks to community input Conference. processes from the beginning when we had a red line document and it's now a series of new meetings and meetings with counselors and, and the input here. And I think this is one of the most important that we've added, but it's a direct impact of community input when folks said the old plan didn't do this and it needs to. And I think we've heard that 
Um, and I think to me saying we've added those 17 pieces, including something for environmental justice is pretty progressive and forward thinking for us given how poorly we performed in the past. And so I do think it's having looked at this proposed amendment and seeing what we've already adopted tonight, which includes some of that language that addresses those, I'm confident that we have the direction uh, that will govern our IDO process that allows us to dig into those policies a little better. So I don't necessarily think this amendment is appropriate here. I think we've covered and accomplished a lot already in this area and can really dig in uh, when we need to at IDO. So thank you. Councilors, any other, there was no second on that motion. Um, any other, uh, that, that brings us back to the three items labeled A and uh, shot. Shanna, do you want to just describe each of those? That I noticed the staff language that basically says these are each of these is a major change of direction, and there are amendments to each of the or, the the, uh, the, uh, the two resolutions in the ordinance, right? Mr. President, yes, that's correct. Um, for the most part, the requests just remove the bulk of the language entirely from the two resolutions and ordinance, which would essentially make them ineffective. They're not necessarily amendments, but just deletions. All right, is there any, uh, any other questions about that? Any counselors that wish to sponsor these? All right, seeing none, we're back on the bill as amended. Counselors, uh, any discussion? Councilor Gibson. I, uh, I don't think that we need we should vote on this before thanking again all of the planners the planning staff Michaela and Russell and of course Shauna and and uh, Andrew who departed far too soon for us no he's not dead he's he's happy in Denver he's a long way away. <laughs> but yeah he's a long way away and he worked his heart out just like all of you and more people I did not mention so um, very, very grateful to all of you. Thank you. And I, I did remember one question that I needed to be reminded to ask and nobody reminded me. And that's about the map, the actual uh, figure 5-6, which is the map of, uh, of areas of, of consistency and areas of change. And, and one of the speakers brought that up and we've heard about that. Uh, and I wanted to, uh, and so I did ask staff about that, and that map is from back in October, and um, I think it needs to be updated as far as I could see. I found a few discrepancies in there myself when I was looking at it in detail. And of course, um, the methodology for, for that map is described in detail in appendix, help me out here. H, I believe. H, um, that methodology, you know, we could, we could hear extensively about that if you like, but I, I think we've, we've heard a lot about that methodology. One key in part though I want to point out of that is that areas with metropolitan redevelopment plans are mapped as areas of change. That doesn't mean that they're going to be carte blanche wide open for development, rather it means it, re it refers you back to the metropolitan redevelopment plan for the area and areas without any MR plan uh, are not mapped a, as, a, as a, an entire block of area of change, but I think by definition, uh, metropolitan redevelopment areas are, were areas that, that by previous councils and previous community discussions were, were acknowledged that, that change was desired, but uh, that doesn't mean uh, full-blown uh, commercial development. Uh, President Benton, the uh that is true for the most part. We did look carefully at the text of each metropolitan redevelopment area plan, and there are some that, uh, particularly those done many years ago, really have a single family um, <coughs> protection of the neighborhood focus. Those were not included as areas of change because the plan itself described um, stability within those neighborhoods. So, let, so me those let me stop you right. So on those that describe specifically no change, they, they actually include residential areas, but specifically said no change to the residential area. You still map the part that they, those plans uh, called for commercial redevelopment? 
Correct, uh, okay. President Benton, that is correct. We looked at them and said, of the commercial areas that encourage revitalization, those were included in areas of change, but any uh, single family neighborhoods or other places describing stability were kept as area, areas of consistency. Okay, so, um, so since that map was from back in October, um, uh, we talked about this and I'm asking that that, that map be updated and, and uh, correct some of the anomalies that were in there. President Benton, counselors, yes. The idea is that you are adopting a methodology right. and you are adopting, uh, um, you're establishing a date by which that analysis uh, will take place. So in the meantime, since the last draft of that map was created, for example, zone changes have come through, um, metropolitan redevelopment areas, uh, I believe one was established. So we would be going back and confirming that the most up-to-date map uh, for areas of change and consistency reflects the conditions on the ground as of uh, when the plan is adopted. All right, thank you. Councilors, other comments or discussion? Councilor Sanchez. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Tonight, we heard from both those individuals that support this plan, but I didn't hear anyone say they oppose this plan, but what I did hear is they wanted a deferral. I believe that this is a major, a major change to the Albuquerque Bernalillo County Comprehensive Plan. And I would ask this evening that we uh, move for a 90-day deferral to continue to work with the community that is, needs to be involved in this process. I know that they didn't get these plans till probably December. They probably didn't start looking at these plans until January. And here we are in March, which I don't really believe gives them and gives this community enough time for additional input. Uh, I know that Councillor Pena had basically wanted to look at forwarding all these amendments. I think that we can still look at some of these amendments if we can have a little more time to try to make some modifications, but no one tonight from the audience said that they don't oppose this plan. They all stated that they would like a deferral. I know we would have to suspend the rules to ask for a longer deferral, but I will make a motion for a 90-day deferral this evening yes. to look at this plan. There's a motion and a second for a 90-day deferral uh, on this, uh, these three bills. Uh, a deferral. Uh, deferral would uh, supersede the motion for uh, passage. So any further discussion on the deferral? I will not support the deferral. Um, I, I would just say that, that um, as with any project, you know, you set deadlines, we, we set deadlines, we moved the deadline by six weeks. Um, and we did get some, some good feedback during that six weeks. I would imagine that, that if we were to defer this for, for three months, we would get some more good feedback. But I am on the, of the opinion that this, uh, that the comp plan itself, that these policies in the comp plan are sound and are, uh, that, that do reflect a process, albeit uh, I think staff and everyone acknowledges we all wish we had better uh, participation from the community. You know, many of the community don't vote either. You know, many of the community have difficult lives that, that prevents them from, from uh, being a participant in, in these kind of efforts. They're very, very complex and very, you know, it, it, it's hard for any of us to, to dig through it. There's no doubt about it. And uh, so I, I, I think trying to uh, uh, continue to defer um, for the sake of getting, you know, whatever, however we want to call it, from, from 90 to 95 percent perfect or from, from 95 to 100, I mean, 100 is, is not possible. Um, and that's why we, we characterize this document as a living document that will have to be regularly analyzed based on, on, uh, on an ongoing process. So, any other discussion on Mr. The President, motion? when we started this process, we stated that it could take up to four years. And I know, I, and I want to give the staff a lot of credit because they've done a lot of work over the last two, two and a half years regarding this plan. But again, I think a 90 day deferral would give us the opportunity to look at some of these other amendments and, and to work with the community and work with the neighborhoods to assure that we are doing the right thing for this community. If it's 90% good, I mean, if we can make it 95% good or 99%, almost perfect. 
that's the direction we should take. I know that uh, the, IDO, the IDO is going to play a major component in what is being done, and I think that the community does need to be engaged uh, with the IDO, and the staff definitely needs to reach out to the neighborhoods and to the community. Any other discussion on the deferral? Councilor Pena. You know, I, I hope that we could defer this. I really appreciate all the staff and, and their work. You know, um, when we first ha um, took this vote to update the comprehensive plan, I was very supportive because knowing um, kind of some of the descriptions you just gave, Councilor Benton, in terms of the community and having to navigate through layers and layers and books and books and overlay them in terms of really being able to um, know what's happening in our communities. Many of the people here tonight, and I appreciate the community members that have come out and taken the time to, you know, advocate for others who really um, don't know this process or really, you know, have a difficult time understanding it unless it affects, directly affects them or their property, you know. So um, I, I really appreciate their comments, the time they've taken. We had a, dis and when we took that vote, um, I, I thought that this was going to be a process that was going to be very inclusive and, and really, you know, we're going to take time. It was discussed it could take up to four years, and I really felt that, you know, it, it was appropriate, kind of like what Councilor Sanchez was saying, you know, I think that most of the people here, uh, I heard at the last um, um, meeting that we had from developers, it was a, us against them, you know, and and um, people kept referring to the fact that uh, people just didn't want to support it. Uh, as Councillor Sanchez said, I am um, talking to many of the community members, people think that the plan needs to be updated. Councillor Davis talked about, you know, since 1970s, some plans haven't been visited, and, and that's exactly why people supported this, you know. But now, at the end of the process, for those same people to feel that, you know, they didn't get heard as part of the process is, is for me, um, you know, a little disheartening and, and, and I do support the, the update, you know, I really don't want to be forced to, to um, have to vote against it. You know, Ms. Um, Michaela said last time, you know, I kept thinking, you know, there's a real cultural divide in our city and our community in terms of what people are th thinking a lot of people from from um, different communities are th are thinking there it's kind of like well they really um, don't they don't support it and, and vice versa and then um, um, one of the staff members says that there's a real philosophical difference and she she said that and I just kept pondering on that and then and then the fact that you know I kept feeling like there's this this huge cultural divide in our community and so I, I went and and for all intents and purposes, knowing what I feel, I know a definition of cultural divide is, is that I just decided, you know, I'm gonna look up the, defin the true definition of a cultural divide, right? And so I went to look it up and it says, a cultural divide is a virtual barrier mm. caused by cultural differences that hinder interactions and that are harmonious exchanges between um, different cultures and they, they have a philosophical difference. And you know that was brought up several times at, at the last meeting, and, and it just um, again I'm not arguing against the plan. I actually I actually support the plan, but um, I think an opportunity to make the plan even better is key um, if we really want the buy-in from everyone, and, and so that folks don't feel this was um, you know forced. So thank you. Any other discussion? There's a motion and a second for a 90-day deferral. All those in favor say yes. 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 Opposed? No. no. And that fails on a six to two or two to six vote. All right, we're back on the bill. Um, I, I, I just want to say that, that I do very much respect the people who have gotten involved in this and, uh, and have repeatedly spoken to me about their concerns, but I've also heard from people who don't want a deferral. Um, and I've heard from a lot of people who want to move forward to the IDO process for the very reasons we just were discussing with regard to uh, some of the environmental issues. Um, also people who, I, I think I said before, who don't have a planning area, don't have a sector plan, uh, and would like to move forward to that planning process. Um, And, um, you know, I think one, uh, I heard most of the, most of the requests for deferrals weren't for, 
for 90 days anyway. They were for, for 12 to 14 months. So, um, and, and from what I could see, it was really wanting to start over with the process. And that's clearly what, what I got anyway from, from the folks that were uh, talking start over and, and let us be, you know, have it a bottom up process. And, um, you know, I would just say to the community organizers, many of whom are friends of mine and, and I have, uh, again, a lot of respect for, um, you know, the city is not a community organizer. You know, you guys are the community organizers. And so, you know, where, you know, many of you uh, attended the meetings, um, but where were all the community that you're supporting? I mean, that, that, that are supporting you. I mean, um, I know constructive criticisms were made and I agree with, you know, again, you can always do a better job on community outreach, but you're never gonna get everybody, you know, you're never gonna get the most, you know, stressed working people. So then who is speaking for them? And, and I'm just gonna say, you know, that, that I, I don't think there's any conspiracy here. I don't think there was any, uh, there was any intention to pull the wool over anyone's eyes, and, and, and I think we've tried to do a, a good job. Um, you're out of order, anybody's yelling out. We've heard from you, so I'm taking my time to speak now. Um, I heard a lot of discussion about that this is driven by the developers. One of the first communications I saw was against this was from developers that didn't like a lot of the language in, in it. So, I mean, you know, no, everybody's not always gonna be satisfied. Go ahead and leave. Um, but uh, this is policy, it's a policy document, and it's full of good policy and stronger policy and stronger protections in terms of its language. So, um, I do appreciate all the work that's been put in and um, but I think we need to pass this. I strongly feel like we need to move on and discuss the IDO because that's where the true regulation and, and true protection occurs is through regulation and that's where it occurs. Without it, we're waiting for another however many months or years. Thank you, Mr. President. As co-sponsor, I would like to make a motion. Do we, can we just make a motion on all of them at once or do we have to do each one? Uh, Mr. President, Councilor Jones, there's already a motion on the floor for R108, right. but after that, we'll need motions on 109 and 27 as well. Then I would hope that you will all support this. Okay, there's a motion and a second for approval of R108. All those in favor say yes. 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 Opposed? No. That passes on a six to two vote. Um, one of Go ahead on. I'd make a motion to approve O1627. There's a motion and a second for O1627. Uh, any discussion on that? All those in favor say yes. 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 Opposed? No. And that passes on a six to two vote. Councilor Jones? Ahead. Wrap it up. What's the last one? R16108, 109. 109. All right, there's a motion and a second for R16109. All those in favor say yes. 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 Opposed? No. And that passes on a six to two vote. All right, we need to, yeah. Back to business here. All right, we're on item F, this is 038. Councilors Harris and myself, Councilor Harris. Thank you, Mr. President. I move a due pass of 038. This is amending the code of ethics related to campaign finance disclosure. We'll go ahead and hear from uh, two people who signed up to speak under general public comment. And those are Tad Namiski and Paul Ryan McKenney. Mr. Namiski, not here. Mr. Paul Ryan McKenney. Uh, thank you, President Benton, uh, counselors. Uh, 
it's a pretty short and, uh, and simple ordinance, but it seems to me that it's just putting a hurdle in the way of new folks who want to run for office and participate in the political process. Um, I'm not sure if there is, is, this was meant to solve a particular problem that we've had in the past. Um, I've not seen anything written about that. But uh, it seems like placing a hurdle in the guise of, of calling it transparency. And, and one thing I find particularly questionable is on page two, uh, the end of line four and five, um, talking about who this applies to, it says, even if a formal declaration of candidacy is not yet required. So I'm not really sure how folks are supposed to file um, these reports when they haven't been to the city clerk's office and declared their candidacy. It's, it's, you know, it seems like it's adding something and I'm not really sure that this something is needed. Uh, thank you. Mr. President. Councilor Davis. Mr. McKinney, I, I appreciate this. Um, actually, I know we've worked a lot on election code in the last year. I, and I hope maybe to answer that question and help look at that. I hope you'll uh, take note and I know our attorneys can help do that. But uh, there's a section in the city's election code that says that candidates who are doing work that are election related have to disclose whether they go file the paperwork or not. And it's an ethics requirement to be sure that somebody just doesn't decide not to file and never tell us anything and not sort of self implicate themselves. Um, so I think this follow, I think the intent here is to, to answer your question. I think the intent here is to follow that. Um, so if a candidate is out raising money and spending money saying elect me, um, that they have to also tell us who's paying the bills. Um, it has been an issue in the past uh, when the rules don't kick in. And I think that at, at least uh, in previous elections, and if you look in the, the ethics board here in the city that has taken several complaints about people conducting election activity but not having to uh, disclose for six or eight months until after they've done it has allowed people to skirt the city's rules and not file compliance documents to let us know who's paying the bills for activity that influenced our elections. Um, and so anyway, to address your question, I think there are rules that, that dictate who has to disclose or not. This at least just changes that deadline. I don't know if that changes your opinion at all. Uh, um, um, not particularly, but I do appreciate uh, the, you know, the feedback that you provided uh, about that, Councillor Davis. And, and like you said, yeah, you're required, you know, like you said, eventually to, to disclose all the information, but I, I do understand uh, the desire of people to have that information earlier rather than later. Thank you. All right, we're back on the bill. Any discussion? There's a motion and a second for due pass. I think Councillor Jones has a uh, Councillor Jones, some questions. I just have some housekeeping questions about this. Yeah, you can't escape me, Mr. Davis. Um, a couple things that, that I'm just wondering how it's going to work because this is new. I'm not opposed to it in any way. I think any of us who are running for any kind of office should disclose. We should all work under the same rules. So of course the question, first kind of question is gonna be, and I think I know the answer from looking at this, that, at this is when does it kick in? And I assume it's this mayoral campaign. Uh, it would be the mayor campaign and city council campaigns. However, uh, right now, I think the city council campaigns tend to get started a little bit later, but the city councilors, if they choose to run for re-election, already have to report on, a, on April 15th. Uh, a lot of us won't have a lot of activity. However, um, when Common Cause was coming to talk to us about some of the changes that they sought in the election code and the ethics code, what they were telling us is all over the country, these elections are getting bigger, they're getting more expensive, and they're happening earlier. And uh, in the mayor's race, that is certainly happening. Um, and there are certainly people who are in this mayor's race uh, who are out there and, and talking in, in sort of a, a positive way, um, to use uh, one way of looking at it, um, that, that they are raising a lot of money. And they're, they're saying that to try to encourage other people to support them. And they're already out there trying to garner support for their campaign long before they even have to file a report. And I think it's just good, as uh, Councillor Benton said at the uh, joint press conference, it's, I think it's important for the public before they jump on board with one of these candidates to know who their friends are. So I think it's, it's all about transparency. And I think if someone has made very public declarations that they're running, uh, at least those folks should, fi should file. And if they don't file or someone turns out later that perhaps they've kept it quiet, but they've been quietly raising money, and we find out about it later, then maybe we could issue fines or something else. But uh, also, I think uh, you and I uh, spoke offline, Councillor Jones, about um, when this would take effect. It wouldn't be retroactive. It would just be as of April 15th. So you have to report as of April 15th. You wouldn't have to retroactively report January 15th. At least that's my understanding. 
Thank you, that answers, if I, just a few more questions and then if you're gonna make notes, you can answer them all at once because it's a little bit. So when do they become candidates? Do they become candidates when they fill out the petition to get the signatures? Do they become candidates when the press says they're candidates? Do they become candidates when they appear on blogs? And if, if there's an answer to any of those, who polices them? Who, who enforces? Who enforces this? And are they also going to be, obviously they should be subject to ethics claims and violations and penalties, and how's that going to be handled? Councilor Harris. Uh, maybe uh, Mr. Melendrez, if he could, uh, feels com comfortable uh, answering these. <clears throat> Mr. President, Councilor Jones, um, it, I think it's important to point out that um, as the system sits right now, the city doesn't have a formal declaration deadline within its charter or ordinances. We rely on a state law that guides the declaration of candidacy deadline and that's what the city clerk imposes. <clears throat> that deadline is in August and so as our charter is written now, the first disclosure for um, a non-official, an outside candidate, lands in the middle approximately of July. So we're already in the situation where a candidate for a city office is having to make determinations about their candidacy for financial purposes before they file their formal, de formal declaration. So what this amendment does is it essentially takes that um, financial component of your candidacy back. And I, I think that there would be some need to interpret and apply the rules on a case-by-case -case basis. For example, if you decide that you're not gonna be a candidate until August, which is your filing deadline. Um, I've talked a little bit with the clerk and perhaps there would be a, um, uh, you could go back if, if you've been fundraising or something or you had contributions before that and report sort of back. Um, but I think the point is that if you're fundraising, the charter and the rules contemplate that that is sufficient for candidacy and that you'd be subject to um, the rules of the charter about disclosures. Councilor Jones. And Mr. Melendres, how do we determine they're a candidate if they've not filled out a petition or formally said they are a candidate, nor are they very openly, publicly raising money and spending it? <laughs> Mr. President, Councilor Jones, um, I honestly don't have a qu an answer to that question right now. Perhaps that's something that's debatable amongst the council with folks who've gone through this process more, but um, I, I think that there's a mechanism to enforce this through the uh, ethics board, and to the extent that somebody is doing that, then um, it would be an issue, I think, that could be enforced through that um, avenue. But I'm sorry to, I'm sorry to dominate, but uh, Mr. Melinders, would not someone have to file a complaint with the ethics board to make that happen? I mean, I'm supposed to just going back That's to correct. this is one of those things that, that the people who are going to follow the rules will follow the rules and it's no problem what the rules are. The people who aren't gonna follow the rules, it doesn't matter what the rules are, they're not gonna follow them. So how are we gonna catch them and make them follow the same rules that we do? This won't do it. Well, well, while the president's doing this piece right here, I, if I can answer, I, just from personal experience, Councilor Jones, and I think that's the right question, and, and Mr. Melendrez, I think, has hit on the, the sort of the gap. As I look at the election code, there was a case uh, before our ethics commission during the last election um, where they considered this very question, and essentially what they determined, if I recall, was essentially that if you're spending money on behalf of a candidate, you're a PAC, and if someone files a complaint, you have to follow those rules, and we have those rules. And if, a can and if it's a candidate raising money on their own, they're a candidate. And so there's a, they adopted essentially the state's sort of rule of like $500 or more. But um, someone has to catch them and turn exactly. them into the exit. Yeah, and then there's the one more question that I'm finished, Mr. I, President, sponsors, I yeah. apologize. But it's all these questions that go through my mind when I see things like this. So um, let's say we go through a campaign and it's turned into the ethics committee, but the ethics committee sometimes doesn't act until after the election. So what if the person who's, the complaint was against them and they started raising money too soon but they won the election? Are we gonna diselect them? Um, Mr. President, Councilor Jones, all, all good inquiries. Um, the, the, the fact is right now there's not a um, specifically prescribed sanction for a 
act that violates, and I think as Councillor Davis was alluding, um, the ethics board has some discretion in the way that they sanction. Recall or you know taking away of an office is not one of the authorities that the election board has. Although, I mean, all these mechanisms could potentially work together. As you know, it can be very complex. If somebody uh, did result in that situation, there are avenues for recall if it, that person's constituency felt strongly enough about the violation, and that would be sort of the process to, um, that would be available. Thanks. Councilor Harris. And, and I do appreciate Councilor Jones's concerns, and I think they are valid, and it, but it's sort of endemic to the whole ethics um, system that we have is that sometimes they're hard to enforce these things. But that doesn't mean we don't have rules, and that doesn't mean we don't aspire to greater transparency. So uh, there could be situations where somebody's totally running under the radar, never files anything, um, but if somebody is actually doing enough activity that someone notices, I think there's gonna generate some sort of complaint. And if they're so far under the radar that no one's noticing, then chances are they're not really someone we should be all that worried about anyway. Um, although ideally, uh, we, we have ethics rules just like we have tax return requirements that are purely voluntary. Um, these ethics uh, fo followings are, you know, they're required, but they're voluntary. There's no one out there um, forcing people to do these things. So I think anything that we can do in the realm of transparency, especially something that doesn't really um, cause a lot of disruption to any particular campaign, because if they're raising money, they should be keeping track of it, and if they're keeping track of it, it doesn't uh, it really uh, cause a lot of disruption to their campaign just to report it. Um, other discussion, counselors? Uh, Councilor Harris? urge your support. Um, we do require seven votes, and there's a counselor who is uh, not on the dais right now. I'm not sure if we should um, just go ahead and vote and see what happens. Uh, we want to table for a second. All right. Um, we'll, uh, we'll table that. Uh, uh, motion to table. Uh, all those in favor say yes. 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 Um, I had a question about the next item up. Uh, for Mr. Zizman and uh, and uh, Mr. Melendres, or actually, it's the not the next item. It's it's the one after that. It's the moratorium on North Fourth. We had we had uh, Andrew had drafted interim standards based on the uh, inter interim sort of overlay standards on top of the uh, quarter plan standards um, based on the integrated development ordinance draft. Um, and uh, you know we had some back and forth. Uh, uh, my understanding is the city attorney's office felt like it was uh, it would not be inappropriate to have interim standards along with uh, this moratorium. I feel like they would be helpful. Um, in fact, we've already kind of negotiated with one property owner who was happy to uh, uh, adjust their uh, their application based on those interim standards. Uh, I had a procedural concern about it, which is has to do. Um, with, we did not have, it, have that in the bill book as an amendment. So I would rather not pass it or, or even debate it without those standards. Uh, can you clarify that, Chris? Yes, yeah, sure, Mr. President. Um, there was some, uh, I had some discussions with City Legal and I think we've resolved that the interim standards would be appropriate for moving tonight. They were included in your material last time. Um, and um, I think, we might be able to get them still yeah. for this evening. The council's already reviewed them. If you'd like to defer, we can certainly have them in the bill book for next time. Um, they were I mean, I, I would prefer to pass it tonight, but, but I mean, uh, uh, wouldn't that amendment have, would have had to have been, uh, no. Okay, so we could go ahead and discuss those. If, if Shanna can find them, we'll discuss them. Okay, uh, I move to bring back the uh, previous item 038 uh, off of the table. All those in favor say yes. 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 And uh, we're back on that bill, and I believe uh, Councilor Harris to close. Thank you, Mr. President. I urge your support. All those in favor of 038 amending the Code of Ethics relating to campaign finance disclosures say yes. 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 Opposed? That passes.
Move on to item R159, amending resolution R16147 concerning future management of Candelaria Farm Preserve as a nature study area and wildlife preserve to clarify responsibilities for the process of creating a resource management plan. I move a due pass. There's a motion and a second. And uh, Mr. Jensen from the Open Space, Open Space Advisory Board, he's the vice chair, is taking on this incredibly uh, challenging task of, get, of getting this management plan together. And uh, he requested this language to just further clarify uh, uh, exactly what he's supposed to be doing going forward and giving him the authority to do so. And that's what it's really about. Uh, so unless there's any other uh, discussion on that, I'll urge your support. Um, all those in favor say yes. 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 Opposed? And that passes. And. Uh, Mr. Zaman. Mr. President, I think we have an answer on the, uh, the IDO uh, interim standards. Those amendments are uh, the same as the ones that are included in your iPads right now for the May 6th council meeting. So if you want, for March 6th, excuse me. If you want to refer to those and move those, they're exactly the same as the ones we would be bringing down. Uh, okay. This and, and so, um, all right, so we'll do that. We do have two people sign up to speak, but we'll go ahead and uh, start with this. This is uh, R160, item K, declaring a moratorium of up to six months or the updated, or, or until the updated IDO is finally acted upon by the council, whichever first occurs. <coughs> and this is only on zone changes and the issuance of certain building permits for mixed use development pursuant to the NFMXD zone within the adopted boundaries of the North 4th Street Rank 3 Quarter Plan. I move a due pass. There's a motion and a second from Councilor Jones. We do have two people signed up to speak, uh, Merritt Tully and Joe Sabatini. And just so you know, uh, uh, Councilors, uh, uh, I guess uh, Shan is up getting that attachment that we need for our amendment. President Benton, Councilors, I'm Merritt Tully. I'm here as an active member of the Near North Valley Neighborhood Association uh, and the North Valley Coalition. Um, I participated in the five-year planning process uh, for Fourth Street that resulted in the North Fourth Street Corridor Plan, and I support this moratorium bill and the uh, the uh, uh, interim design requirements. For many months, uh, we've been concerned um, about new development on Fourth Street. Some of the buildings do not conform to what we understood the corridor plan to require. Um, our goal with the plan. Um, which was put together by neighbors and businesses, um, it had broad support, was a highly walkable, vibrant business corridor with neighborhood amenities. Um, that's the kind of corridor that residents across the city are asking for. Um, we expect this moratorium to pro provide the time necessary to fix the glitches and misunderstandings with the plan and ensure quality development in this highly visible corridor. Um, and I encourage you to give the bill a due pass. Thank you, Ms. Tully. And Joe Sabatini? Uh, President Benton, counselors, uh, I too was a participant in the uh, uh, five-year process to develop the plan and am disappointed in some of what I'm seeing in the mixed-use corridor as well. I'm kind of here um, um, surrogate for uh, Father Vincent Chavez of the um, uh, St. Therese Church. I don't know uh, if the scanner is on. I have a, a, a diagram or a, a photograph from 1970 of an aerial of the church and uh, you can take a look at it if, if, if you want. Um, Father Chavez's concern is immediate Ace, the former Ace, Hardware, Ace Furniture Store uh, has been torn down and we're anticipating and concerned about what, that kind of, what the building is like if we get a four-story building uh, that historic property. You just spin that. There you go. Thank you. Um, this is the Ace Furniture right on the uh, south side of the Alameda drain. And... Uh, that church was built in 1954 and is uh, um, unique in its architecture and, and a mainstay of our community. 
And if, if uh, the view of it is blocked by a, a very a high, close to the street kind of building, um, that's not helpful to the fabric of our neighborhood. Uh, I too support the moratorium uh, so that we can address these. We've had uh, the glitches uh, Merritt referred to are very apparent to us and surprising and disappointing. So we hope that um, your um, ordinance will um, enable us to fix that. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Sabatini. Thanks for coming down this late in the evening to speak. And, um, and we did receive a letter from uh, Father Vincent about this. Um, um, I don't know that this would prevent a, uh, the size of building that's required, these interim standards, but, um, but certainly it would uh, ensure that the building is, is uh, well articulated and a, and a human scale. We had a problem with that with, with some, of the, uh, uh, some of the existing uh, recent development, which is good to have the development, but concerns about the quality of the, uh, of the design. Um, and I, I think we've, uh, we're still waiting on those uh, interim. I've actually got a copy here, but I should have just given that to the Xerox machine. Do we have it in there, or, or did I just miss it? Mr. President, Councillor Benton, um, it is included in your iPads, but it, uh, it was for the March 6th. So it's in the previous meeting. Right. Okay. And so I think the most efficient way to deal with it would be to have the council refresh or refer to the March 6th amendment okay. and move that amendment. Um, Andrew Webb worked with planning to, to make one, I think, minor but important addition to that. And essentially what the amendment does is it says the moratorium will be in place but during this temporary moratorium, um, development may proceed if it complies with a set of design guidelines that are uh, already proposed in the IDO. Um, and so what you'd be voting on with the amendment is to apply those interim design guidelines. Um, and if you'd like to vote on that amendment, um, what, I, what I could do, and I think it'd be pretty easy, is just read in Andrew's minor amendment uh, with clarifying language. and I'll. I'll, I'll just say it now to, so you All can right. see how simple it is. The following requirements supplement those that exist in the North 4th Street, North 4th Street Rank 3 Quarter Plan. In the event of a conflict, these interim design requirements shall prevail. So it's essentially um, just putting in a hierarchy of how they would work with the existing plan. And then that attachment, I see the Exhibit A was part of that. Mr. President, correct. All right, and so counselors, if you wanna look at that, that and, and for the record, that's in the, uh, the bill book from March 6th. Um, I'll move that amendment as described by uh, Chris as men, amendment number one to uh, R160. Is there a second? second? There's a motion and a second from Councilor Gibson. Um, and uh, as I said, I think we, we already have had some, some previous discussions uh, with, with a, actually a, a, a building permit applicant who uh, was once he looked at the interim standards, was more than happy to uh, to make adjustments to his design and, and did not see them to be onerous. So, uh, and correct me if I'm wrong, Ms. Jacoby, but I, I think uh, this uh, this concept of having interim standards is, is something that that supported uh, can be supported legally. Um, President Benton, yes, I've had those conversations with Mr. Melendres, and City Legal does support. Um, those kind of standards with respect to this moratorium. Thank you. And, the, and as I explained to Mr. Sabatini and just with regards to Father Vincent's comment, this would not necessarily prevent anybody from building the type of building that we've discussed, but there would be some stronger uh, guidelines in the interim. So I urge your support. There's a motion and a second for due pass as amended for R160. All those in favor say yes. yes. Opposed? And that passes, and um, we have one more bill to discuss, but I will move that we suspend the rules to extend the meeting until uh, Mr. President. T till, till what, uh, 1040, is that <coughs> an adequate? Mr. President, I don't believe we voted on the amendment to the oh, last Oh, I'm bill. sorry. Oh, so we were on the amendment. I'm, I beg your pardon. Right. Got ahead of myself. Um, so we, we, did, we did not vote on the amendment. All right, I'm sorry. So back on the amendment uh, to R160, all those in favor say yes. yes. Opposed, and that passes. And then back on the bill as amended, 
All those in favor say yes. 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 Opposed? No. no. One uh, vote no, uh, uh, Councilor Lewis. And um, that passes. So I'll move to suspend the rules till uh, 1040. A motion and a second. All those in favor say yes. yes. Opposed? And Councilor Gibson, R-168. Thank you, Mr. President. R-168 is adjusting Department of Family and Community Services fiscal year 2017 City Housing Fund appropriations to provide for the acquisition <coughs> of property to be used for an affordable housing, transitional housing, behavioral health services project in collaboration with Bernalillo County. I'm going to move a due pass on this. Second. There's a motion and a second for a due pass on R-168. Uh, is there anyone signed up to speak? No? Okay. Um, I do have some questions on this. Is there somebody here, Mr. Chaplin? Um, and I'll just go ahead and start. I have several questions. Um, and this might be for the sponsor as well. Um, how was the funding amount determined? Um, I know that, that, that this may, the inception of this may have been when there was a property in mind, but how was this funding amount determined? Uh, Mr. President, the, the funding amount is a carryover from the previous bill um, that was determined for that, that size, and so we're just carrying it forward um, as we, uh, it, it, Council decides to approve this and the developer goes forward and identifies other sites. That site might still be one that comes into play, um, but that was just uh, an estimate of what we think would the need would be. All right. Um, so it's a theoretical site of, at $2 million. In the event a site is located and requires additional funds, uh, where would the additional funds come from? Uh, Mr. President, at this current time, the additional funds would have to come from outside funding, such as uh, low-income housing tax credits or private bank financing or grants. Okay. Uh, and um, I think this is kind of an important question. How much will Yes Housing charge to participate in the ABCGC Behavioral Health Initiative or other processes to identify <coughs> potential housing sites, um, spe uh, specify the target population and develop a service delivery plan that will dictate the master development plan. Uh, Mr. President, there hasn't been a specific amount identified for that. My thinking going into that is that they're doing this with the expectation of a developer's fee on the other side. Um, there could be some planning funds that we'd, we might have to to come up with for the participation and identifying of the, uh, the services to be delivered and the possible tenant selection? Um, I mean, I, I, you know, that does concern me. I mean, I feel like there should be some sort of cap on soft cost on, on something like this. I mean, there's just a potential that, I mean, there, I mean, I'm just gonna say right out front, there's several things about this proposal that concern me right now. Um, and that's one of them is, is, you know, what's the lid on soft costs? We don't even have a say yet. We're proposing to, to put two million in place for it. Um, and I guess the last question I have is what, what would be the timeline on this for, for something actually materializing? Councilor Gibson. Thank you. Um, I, I, the intent of this is to secure that two million for some future site and um, but I wouldn't be opposed to amending this to cover any soft costs or, or uh, ancillary costs going forward I don't know how, uh -huh. how the director feels uh -huh. that, that's the type of thing that we do sometimes right well, well uh, the workforce housing uh, trust fund ordinance caps all soft costs at 20% um, I think for a single project that may seem a little bit a little bit high. Mm -hmm. um, it, developers fees tend to be you know 12 or so percent, mm -hmm. uh, but that's on, on the back side and there's a lot of other funds. Um, but that would be 
the area that we that I would be looking at, you know, that that would that would sort of limit it. I certainly um, there's no advantage in, in going forward spending all this money on soft costs and not securing a site. And Mr. President, if I may just add, um, this is a part of the Albuquerque Bernalillo, Bernalillo County Government Commission um, behavioral health response. You know that we want to be able to uh, identify these funds to participate in that, a site mm -hmm. selection and the tenant selection to offer that services. And so right. we're just trying to to advance that cause. And, and don't get me wrong, I'm fully supportive of that cause. I mean, uh, and, and, and we're regular, I shouldn't say this, maybe I won't say it since I shouldn't say it. But I think we, you know, it, the city's been sort of called into question, well, you know, what are we putting into the deal, you know? And, and I get it. I mean, I know that we're putting a lot into all sorts of supportive housing and all sorts of important housing projects at the same time, um, you know, uh, with regard to the, the projects that are being brought before the, the uh, Behavioral Health Initiative and so forth, um, I, I share the desire to get something out in front of them. I just, I guess I, I have some concerns clearly about uh, uh, just putting a, a, a nice round figure out there of two million and not knowing the site. Um, and I'm wondering just how we could perhaps massage this and perhaps massage a cap on the on the soft costs, I'm not at all unsupportive of it, but I, I, I just don't feel comfortable in its present form. I wonder if the, if the sponsor would consider a deferral and try to hammer on this a little bit. And Absolutely, I will move for a deferral uh, until next meeting, whenever that is, April third. Okay, and and uh, there is a motion and a second for deferral until April third. And, and during that time, you know, let's just, I think these are my primary questions. Uh, let's, let's just hash them over and, and, uh, and see where we need to go. All right. So there is a motion and a second for a deferral. All those in favor say yes. Opposed? And that passes. And there being no further business, this meeting is adjourned.